is with this little presentation about real ear measurement. Uh, because real ear measurement is a, uh, is a very hot topic today. It's hotter than it's ever been. Uh, and in some years it's been hot, in some years it's been cold, in some years it's been zero, and in some years it's been 100%. And that's all because of the attitude of dispensers has changed as circumstances have changed. But today, there's, in the world of hearing aid dispensing, there is a lot of competition. There's competition from outfits that are selling hearing aids, dispensing hearing aids online, uh, from Costco, Walmart, Sam's Club, and all of these kinds of things that we just didn't have before. There are audiologists that dispense hearing aids, and they dispense them out of ear, nose, and throat physicians, offices, speech and hearing clinics, private practices, and hospitals. Uh, but there are also dispensers of hearing aids that are not audiologists. They are simply technicians. Uh, and they're all competing for a very large group of individuals. They're baby boomers like me that are um, reaching their 60s and, um, and will be, if they're not already, in, um, in need of hearing aids. In our days, when we grew up in the 60s and 70s, we certainly used, we certainly listened to a lot of real loud rock and roll. Okay? Those were the days, and hearing protection, we just never even heard about. You know? um, so, one thing that is important is for an audiologist who dispenses to distinguish themselves from the other dispensing organizations. And one way to do that is to merge art and science. Many dispensers have developed an art of dispensing. Um, they have very good um, technique, sales technique, with their patients. They develop good rapport with their patients. Their patients love them. They bring them cakes. Um, and therefore, they do well as far as the numbers of hearing aids that they dispense. Um, and even, even the perceived um, value that patients get. However, it's an art. And I'll show you how those fittings are when you use art alone. The fittings are not what they should be. Ideally, you would have an art like that because you need it, but also merge science with that. And when you do, that's when you'll do uh, the best job for, for the patient. It's important to look at this, and very few graduate students in audiology do look at this, uh, because, hey, I'm not a salesman. I'm an audiologist. I'm a clinician. But when it comes to hearing aids, there is an aspect of sales. Uh, and it might be uh, a big difference even in an audiologist's income, depending on how they're paid, whether it's a straight salary or whether it's salary plus commission. Commission is usually on the hearing aids. Or, if they're in private practice, then they certainly want to be able to dispense as many hearing aids as possible. So that's the only reason I show you this slide. And it has to do with real ear measurement and other measurements of a hearing aid because it, this, these devices are very helpful in you doing these things. If you were to sell anything, if I were trying to sell you this Verifit, one thing that for sure that I would have to do, if somebody sells you a car, somebody sells you uh, an, an iPhone, a Blackberry, an iPad, whatever it is, they have either created or shown you that you need this, right? So it's important to be able to show the patient, in our case, um, the need for a hearing aid. And I'll show you how to use devices like the Verifit to show the, the patient their need for a hearing aid. To demonstrate need is important. And also to demonstrate benefit. Yeah, you need this. Um, and if you get this, here I can show you what the benefit will be. 
you know, every sale involves um, demonstrating a need and demonstrating a benefit. You also have to, as a good salesperson, conveys personal enthusiasm. You know? Because if you're not enthusiastic about the product, if you don't believe in it yourself, in your heart of hearts, then it's going to be very difficult to convey something that's false to someone else. You know? People believe things that they see enthusiasm about. And they can read in the person that's trying to tell it to them that this is the truth, that this person believes this. Uh, it's a sense that we all have, an intuition. Um, and people will come up with objections. Yeah, but it costs too much. Yeah, but I won't figure out how to use this. Um, and part of the job is to overcome those objections. You know? um, and actually to inspire confidence in the patient. The patient has confidence that, first of all, what you're saying is true. Um, they have confidence in your integrity, and they also have confidence in your ability as a clinician, and that you want what's best for them, and that uh, you'll do whatever it takes to make that happen. And then finally, to be a resource. You know? Sandra was saying how much she uh, she likes Metacoustics and, and, and me, um, uh, and Auburn acquires their audiological equipment through, through Metacoustics. And uh, I'm grateful for that as well, because it's a mutual relationship. You know? uh, but I think the reason why, is as she, as she clearly stated, is that we have become, not only me, but the company, um, a resource for the clinic here at Auburn. When something is needed, um, or when something has to be known, or there is a, a problem, then uh, we are a resource to find that information, get whatever is necessary, solve the problem uh, in a way that is most efficacious and uh, efficient and timely. You know? so, you should. You need to be that same thing for the for the patient. The patient, you're you're a resource that they that they know they can always call on, and when they do call, they get a response, uh, a a, uh, a quick response, mm -hmm. and they uh, uh, they also get whatever they need or whatever problem that it is uh, sufficiently solved. Uh, so. The reason I show you this is because as we talk about these things this afternoon, this is what we'll have in mind, how all of this can be enhanced by, by properly using a piece of equipment like this. Okay? It's something that most people in programs like this don't talk about um, or might not realize. But this is it's important when it comes to hearing it. And you might have heard this, you might not have. But only 20% of people who dispense hearing aids use any type of measurement of the hearing aid. 30% have some piece of equipment. If you poll them, 30% will say that they have some piece of uh, hearing aid measurement equipment. Whether it's a hearing aid analyzer, or a real ear measurement, or both. Um, 30% of them have a device, but only 20% will, will claim that they use that on all or most of their fittings. Yeah. Uh, so why not? Why is it 100%? Why is it that it's only 20%? Well, here's two reasons why it might be. Really, your measurement. Uh, has all these benefits that I'm going to show you. Well, why wouldn't you use it? Well, these two myths have been um, pretty widespread, and that is that real ear measurements are not needed with digital hearing aids, and all hearing aids today are digital. There was a day, 10 years ago, beyond, uh, where all hearing aids weren't digital. Uh, some were linear hearing aids. Uh, and 
there's a vast difference in complexity in the way that they process uh, their, the input, whatever sound there is, and the way they process speech. But today they're all hearing aids. They, I'm sorry, they're all digital hearing aids, and there is a myth going around, and it's pretty widespread, that you don't need real ear measurement with today's digital hearing aids. It's all taken care of by the manufacturer, the fitting software, and the, uh, uh, and the programming device, and the hearing aid itself. Uh, and the next myth is real ear measurements can't be used on digital hearing aids, even if you wanted to. They're not needed. But if you thought they were and you wanted to do it, you can't do it on digital hearing aids. It's not effective. And so because of those two myths, um, uh, a lot of dispensers don't make any kind of measurement. The one, many of them that have some piece of equipment, you find that that piece of equipment is in a closet somewhere on a back shelf that has collected dust. If you open it up, it's got a bunch of old hearing aids in it. Uh, hearing aid batteries in it, a couple of old hearing aids in it, um, and nobody remembers how to use it. It might not even work. Uh, and certainly it's out of date to the point where that particular instrument wouldn't be usable today, probably anyway. Okay. So the angel is flying on this one instead of the devil standing there because um, real ear measurements are effective on digital hearing aids. These are myth busters. Um, if, first of all, we use an appropriate prescriptive formula. Now, if we're fitting a hearing aid with real ear measurements, we have a target, a prescription. Uh, and uh, the prescriptions that existed in the past, when all hearing aids were not digital hearing aids, are just no longer effective for digital, hear for digital hearing aids. So it would have to be modern prescription formulas that are precisely designed for these kinds of hearing aids with the kinds of features that they have today that are a result of digital signal processing. So that's important. And also important that we use the proper input signal. I'll show you some different signals that could be used to fit hearing aids and to test hearing aids. And you'll see there's quite a bit of difference. They can't all be right, only one is right. Uh, so an appropriate input signal uh, that is going to make this hearing aid process uh, sound the way it processes human speech. Okay. Uh, and that the appropriate measures are made, that inappropriate measures aren't made. So those, those three things, if we do that, then really the measurements certainly are effective, more effective than ever on digital hearing aids. Okay, so you might say that, or you might consider these four things part of a way we would evaluate uh, or the way we would expect hearing aid fittings to be successful. First of all, that the patient is pre-qualified by the clinician. In other words, you have decided that this is a hearing aid candidate. All right? Some patients are not hearing aid candidates. One might be, well, they just don't have sufficient hearing loss to be a hearing aid candidate. Or two, they might have so much hearing loss that they'd be a better candidate for a cochlear implant than, than a hearing aid. Okay? So are they an, an, a, uh, an appropriate candidate? Or is it contraindicated for some reason? And the patient must have an understanding of the hearing treatment and the options. He must understand um, here's what we can do for you. Here's what the options are. And have realistic expectations. Sometimes the, uh, the patient's expectations don't match what's possible. Right? So that's important that they understand as much as possible uh, about what the options are. Then when we do the fitting, it must be verified somehow using this type of instrumentation to actually know what we have rather than just using the art of um, programming the hearing aid as per manufacturer's uh, recommendations and then trying to assess the efficacy of the fitting simply by a discussion with the patient. How does that sound, Mrs. Jones? 
Well, of course, unless it's too loud, it's going to sound fine to her uh, if there's any amplification at all. And many times this, is in, this amplification is in the low frequencies where there's little or no amplification needed and, and, uh, and not present in the high frequencies that they need it. So the, the hearing, the fitting is verified. And the patient is involved in the fitting. Because part of what makes this kind of thing work is that seeing is believing. If a patient believes that it is a good fitting, they are going to wear the hearing aid more, um, and they're going to be more successful with it. They're going to be less likely to return it, and they're going to be more likely to refer other patients to you. So you want them to be involved in this fitting um, when, it, when that's appropriate, uh, an, an adult patient, for example. Okay. So this is an old slide, because this was in, ninth, in 2004, ages ago, right? Uh, but at that time, surveys indicated, and this was a survey uh, done by Hearing Review, and it indicated that 83% of hearing aid instruments that were dispensed in the United States were digital devices, compared to 27% in 2001. 83% digital devices, okay? Uh, and see how that grew? Uh, in 81, it was 27% uh, in, I'm sorry, in 2001, 27% digital. In 2002, 45% digital. In 2003, 66% digital. In 2004, 83% digital. And today, it's 100% digital, okay? Uh, there, there are no analog here. Uh, one of the problems is returns. Now, you might not have that problem here at, at, at the Auburn Speech and Hearing Clinic because it's a unique setting. However, out in, um, in retail settings, there are, uh, there's always an issue with hearing aids that are returned for credit. In other words, you have to return it to the manufacturer and the manufacturer will give you credit for it. Uh, because it's very common that you say to a patient, you can try this for 30 days. If it works out in the 30 days, then you keep it. If not, then uh, you return it and you'll get a refund. And that's a very, when I first heard that, I thought, what are you, crazy? You can't do that. You wouldn't buy a car and have them uh, say to you, well, you drive it around for 30 days, and if you like it, you keep it, we'll cash your check. Otherwise, uh, uh, you just bring it back here, and we'll give you your money back. Uh, or any other item, for that matter. Uh, we wouldn't do that unless there was some drastic problem with, uh, even with the equipment. But it's common in the world, in the hearing aid industry, in this market. And um, even though you don't want to do that, you're forced to do it for marketing reasons because the competition is doing it. You know? uh, and the problem is that with digital hearing aids, you can see there were more return for credit than there were with less complex hearing aids. And it's not because they weren't as good. It's because they cost more. So, so people have high expectations the hearing aid doesn't meet the expectation, and they say, oh, I'm not spending that kind of money. Okay. And now they're going elsewhere. They're turning to the internet, Sam's Club, Walmart, elsewhere. So what can you do? Well, you could bring the price down. But do we really want to bring the price down? Um, then we're resorting to what's happening at the internet, and on the internet, and at uh, department stores. We're professionals. You're an audiologist. You have a doctorate. Uh, you have uh, made a major investment, not only in education, but in instrumentation and in time. Um, and so rather than bringing the price down, um, making less profit, let's make a reasonable profit that is appropriate for the profession and for the, uh, for the, the product. Uh, but raise the, uh, raise the 
perceived value, right? So it's instead of lowering the price, we'll raise the perceived value of the instrument. Because those are the only two. Increase the, va the perception of value to more closely align with the price. Make it seem like it's worth it. Right? Or, better way to put it, have the patient realize that it is worth the money. And making these types of measurements are a way to do this. And to boost their confidence in you. So they'll have confidence in you as a clinician. Uh, even if it costs more, you're recommending this make and this model, this particular technology, and it costs more than what they're seeing elsewhere, but they have confidence in you, in you as a professional. They have confidence in the technology that they're buying and that you're using to fit them. And uh, they, this equipment helps you instill that, that confidence. Okay, so now a successful thing is going to be the patient purchases it, he buys it, 30 days go by, he doesn't return it, he's wearing it, it's not in a, in a, in a, uh, on the shelf or in the drawer, he, and his, uh, his hearing device has made a positive impact in his life. Others, family members, and other people that is associated with the patient can agree with the benefit. They see the benefit. This patient refers other patients, and of course it's not returned for credit. Uh, so the solution is these types, this type of technology that we're going to see in a few minutes, this visible speech mapping. Uh, it's most often called. That is the... Um, that is the real ear measurement that of choice today is visible speech mapping. Okay. Um, it does several things for us. It gives the patient the confidence because now seeing is believing. They're not only hearing the difference or hearing about the benefit from you, they're actually seeing the difference and seeing the benefit because they can understand what they see on the measurement screen. Uh, it shows the patient the benefit, uh, and it offers them the latest technology. You are merging now art and science. Okay. You, you are um, probably not aware of this, but there was an article that was published in Consumer Reports in 2009 that had more impact on the hearing yeah. instrument uh, world than any other article than, than a thousand articles published on this subject in professional journals. And it was also put in a, that article about the AARP magazine too. Mm -hmm. so right. Yeah. I'm a member of AARP, and that's yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, that that was everywhere, and um, I I have people tell me even today, now it's 2011, and they say, I have patients that bring that in to me because they saved it. They framed it. <laughs> and uh, because it is something that, uh, that people are really interested in. It's the first time there's been uh, an article for the general public like that that has said so much and been so, had such high awareness. Okay? And here's two quotes from it. One was, search for a hearing instrument dispenser that uses a real ear measurement device in the fitting process. Uh, the reporter that wrote this, the journalist that wrote up this article, spent months working on it and researching it. Did a great, great job. And tr found, tried to find somewhere, some, that she could go where she would get an unbiased professional opinion, an objective opinion from an expert, a world-renowned expert. Well, she ended up at Vanderbilt. Good thing that she did. She ended up, of course, if she ended up here, it would be just as good. But she ended up at, at Vanderbilt, very high-profile uh, audiology clinic, and she ended up talking to uh, Todd Ricketts, very well-known. It's a name that you don't, maybe you don't know now, but you will know. Uh, in fact, he might be a speaker at the Alabama Academy of uh, Audiology meeting 
this September down in Gulf Shores or wherever it is. Uh, but anyway, um, so she got an insight from Vanderbilt and their clinic and observed for quite a while what they do in the fitting process. And so she knew all about real ear measurement. And another quote, besides telling consumers to find somebody that does this, because they are going to be the ones that merge art and science and do a better job. And she'd also heard from Todd Ricketts that of hearing aids that are fit without the and in the ear measurement, a measurement actually done on the ear, as many as two-thirds are misfit uh, because they did a study. They did a study of uh, getting patients in who had acquired a hearing aid outside of Vanderbilt because this would never happen there, just like it wouldn't happen here. Uh, but acquired hearing aids from various sources, and these hearing aids had been fit, personally fit for them. Uh, and then they actually made measurements on those and found out that two-thirds of them, 66% right, are misfit and typically underfit. Often, most often, the device is not even making the high frequencies audible at all. Okay? Uh, and people who um, convert to making real ear measurements when they didn't before, they believe the myth, right? Or they were just complacent. Complacency is part of it. Because they feel, well look, I'm doing fine. I'm selling 20 hearing aids a month. Everybody's happy. I'm bringing home the money. Um, nobody's, and, nobody's returning their hearing aids. And, yeah. Right. If they're not returning their hearing aids, um, then um, why fix it if it ain't broke? Is a common statement, a common saying. The thing is that we've had a major recession a couple of years ago in 2008, and today consumers are a little bit more weary than they were in the past. And today people are, that return rate is going back up again um, because, again, the expectations and the price um, need to be adjusted. So, anyway. Uh, people who are converts, and we're getting more and more converts now than ever, and I'll show you some reasons for that, some other reasons for that, too. Uh, converts meaning they dispensed without making any measurements in the ear, and now, all of a sudden, they acquire something like this, and now they're doing it. Uh, and, and doing it consistently. Some will do it only in certain cases. I got a tough to fit. This woman is complaining. She's coming back a hundred times. I got to do something. Let's let's get the machine out and use that. Okay. I don't mean them because they they don't have large enough numbers to come to any conclusions that make any sense. But converts who decide I'm changing my standard of care. My standard of care is going to be to do this to use this science because I believe in it. Why do I believe in it? Because every expert, not just my instructors at Auburn University when I was a graduate student, but every expert in the field agrees with this and has said it, you know? It's not a myth. So, I'm, I'm now going to do it. I've decided for one reason or another. I could, either, I could finally afford the equipment I thought I couldn't before. That's a myth because all you gotta do is sell a few more hearing aids and you can afford it. Um, but also, once they do that and start using it on every patient, they always, 100% of them say, I will never do without it again because I did an experiment. Since I was used to not using it, I would first set the hearing aid up with the fitting software without it, whichever way I would have done it before. Uh, I would select first fit, I would do whatever, okay? Let them let, use the manufacturer's default gain settings for, that are consistent with the hearing loss. Uh, but then, since I've changed my standard of care and I now make a measurement, I would make a measurement on what I'd already done. And, and about two-thirds of the time, I would find that I'm not satisfied. I could do much better. 
And so I tweak it now when it's in the ear and get it right and, and then hit save program the hearing aid. You know? I, this is for, for you and they don't know this yet, but next, um, Dr. Klusing and I were talking about their homework assignment for next week. Next Wednesday they're going to be learn, they're going to be doing speech mapping. So their homework assignment will be um, on four people, they're given an audiogram and they'll be doing it on each other. Kind of not, not that severe an audiogram. But they're the first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna they're gonna look at soft speech, average speech, and loud speech in a first fit. Then they're gonna do the same and print that out. Then they're gonna and look at audibility, you know, using NAL1 or ESL. Then they're gonna redo that on the final fit, and then they're gonna redo it when they've actually programmed it to be target. Yeah, uh, so you'll be doing this exact experiment. You'll be seeing, well, what if I didn't make a measurement? How would it have come out on its own? I wouldn't have known unless I looked at it after that and, and found that. So, so this, this, I think you'll find is true, that without making a real ear measurement, the majority, 66% of hearing aids are misfit, mostly under. So. There are several of these kinds of things on the market, three main manufacturers, okay? Um, one is GN Otometrics. GN, uh, GN is, stands for Great Nordic. And GN Otometrics, uh, the GN company owns Resound. They also own Maxin. Uh, and they own ICS Medical. Uh, Resound, of course, you know, is a hearing aid manufacturer. Um, and uh, Maxon is an audiometer and middle ear analyzer. Uh, not, not uh, well, it's a, an audiometer and tympanometer manufacturer. Uh, and um, they also own ICS Medical, which is a manufacturer of evoke potential equipment and vestibular equipment. Okay. Um, so they're one of the um, of, of, of several major manufacturers of audiometric instrumentation, and they have a device called uh, an Oracle Speech Link. Uh, this patient is wearing it around his neck. The, the uh, NOAA link is attached to it, doesn't have to be. Uh, and he's got two probes in his ears. And a lot of dispensing audiologists and other dispensers actually put up big screens because they want the patient to see this. Many of these things are designed to be pretty graphic, uh, where you can easily explain uh, to, to the patient uh, you know, and, uh, the benefit of the hearing aid, the need for the hearing aid. Is the, is, the, is the speaker around his neck? No. Uh, there's, a, there's a speaker out on the table okay, that you can't okay. see. That's just a measurement device. Oh, okay. uh, and it connects with uh, with a PC, the PC drives the speakers, and it connects uh, to a PC with the same Bluetooth that drives this. Yeah, it's, it's a wireless connection. Uh, GN Autometrics is also the manufacturer of the HiPro and the Note Link, uh, even though that's not publicized. See, this is what their thing looks like when it's sitting on the charge of okay. okay, so that is inexpensive. That's $4,500. Now, they're coming out with a new one, and it's going to be $6,500, $2,000 more. Uh, later this year, it's called the Free Fit, but it'll look exactly the same, and this is upgradable to that. Okay, and just have more features on it. They're all trying to compete with this. Uh, then there is a company in Florida called Medrex, M-E-D-R-X. Uh, and they make a little real ear measurement device called the Avant. Right? That you find mostly in hearing aid distributors that are not, hearing aid dispensers that are not audiologists. Um, this, this, the biggest market they have are non-audiology dispensers. Though I do have several audiologists, Northside ENT in Atlanta, who has two of these and swear by it. Um, then there is the Cadillac of these things, which is the Audio Scan Verifit, Audio Scan's the manufacturer. They have a portable version of that too. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you've seen the portable version, but it is, it operates 
very much like this, except that it only has one probe, and it has a few uh, less capabilities than the Veracruz has, but not much. It's very complicated. Anyway, okay. So look at this. Here are three different, these are output curves. You, know, you can measure two kinds of curves, gain and output. And we'll show you the difference between This is the actual output. So you notice that this scale goes from 60, it could go from zero, but it doesn't have to in this case. It goes from 60 to 120 dB SPL. Right? It's just measuring the output of the hearing aid in the ear. Okay? Uh, and these four curves, the, the hearing aid is set the same on all four curves. You might have think, oh, I turned the hearing aid up. No. Uh, oh, I used a, a louder signal. No. Same intensity signal. 70 dB, right? Just three different, four different types of signals. So the hearing aid is set the same, and the intensity is the same for all four of these. But the hearing aid is producing four different outputs that are drastically different. This one is, this one is a pure tone. Uh, this one is speech weighted pure tone. This is speech itself. And then this one is composite noise. A composite noise is a broadband noise. In other words, it's not frequency specific. It's a wide range of frequencies. Uh, and uh, usually it's done by taking a whole bunch of pure tones, like 60 to 120 pure tones, and maybe modulating them a little bit, like a warble tone is, and meshing them together. And they call that a composite uh, Right? Composite noise. And so, but you see the difference. And why is the difference? Because this is a digital hearing aid. It wouldn't happen on a linear hearing aid. Linear hearing aid does the same no matter what you put into it. But a digital hearing aid treats different kinds of sounds differently. So it processes speech different than it processes a pure tone or a composite noise or a vacuum cleaner, you know? Um, because we could actually say today, the hearing aid companies, they'll come in here and they'll tell you, our hearing aid is so sophisticated that it analyzes everything that comes into it, all sound. It, it determines what is speech, and then it, it, it um, uh, when, when it determines that, that the input is speech, then it gives that the, the proper amplification, the proper compression, the proper emphasis, frequency response, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it, it does everything you can do to enhance the speech. But when it hears something that is not speech, then it reduces it. That's noise reduction. So it gives you the best possible signal-to-noise ratio, the difference between the noise, background noise and the actual speech. Okay. Well, that's good. But uh, today you can say that. If you said that 20 years ago, and, you know, you could, you'd get a fine, you put out of business by the FDA for false advertising, because it couldn't be done. But today it can be done, and we can see that four different signals are at the same level are processed four different ways. So which one would we use? In the past, we used to use pure tones that swept from low frequencies through high frequencies as a test signal to fit a hearing aid. Um, or we used a composite noise. Well which would be correct? Neither one of them. Because what's really correct is speech, since that's what we're trying to make audible and intelligible and comfortable for. We don't care about pure tones. They could be, as far as we're concerned, they could be attenuated like noise by the hearing aid. Uh, okay. So here's a, a different hearing aid circuit doing the same thing treating all four of these signals, though they're all the same level, uh, quite a bit differently. And look at this one. Here, with a pure tone, this particular thing, which was um, uh, a particular digital hearing aid, okay? As soon as that got to 2,000 hertz, boom! The output dropped to almost nothing, you know? Uh, now, that didn't happen with speech. It didn't happen with composite noise, but but when they used the pure tone, this happened. That's crazy. You know why? It, the, the, the circuit thought the hearing aid was going into, into feedback. And so it, 
it cut the alpha way down because it had that type of feedback suppression. Nobody does that anymore. But I, the reason I showed you these three slides is just to, to make the point that the signal you use to fit the hearing aid has got to be speech. That's why visible speech mapping. Uh, the others are inappropriate. Uh, and so that's why speech is recommended and visible speech mapping mapping is recommended because it is the most important input signal that the patient will want to hear at, hear well and hear comfortably. Okay? And speech is processed different than the other signals because speech is very complex, much more complex than other noises. Uh, it, it quickly shifts from low frequencies to high frequencies. Um, it's, got, it's, it's modulated. There are spaces of quiet in between syllables, words, and sentences. Uh, it's, it's very, very complex. And when a hearing aid has multiple channels of, of compressors and things like that, the speech is, is actually engaging multiple um, bands, multiple channels, all at the same time and in various ways, different intensities, different frequencies. Where a pure tone that's sweeping doesn't do that, it's engaging just one, uh, one channel or one octave or, or part of an octave at a time as it sweeps from low frequencies to high frequencies. So it's very much different what the way the hearing aid has to handle and process speech than any other kind of, of input. Right? That's why we have to use speech. Okay? And we also have to make measurements at more than one intensity. We can't make measurements just at 70 dB, 60 dB, 50 dB, 90 dB, all of these levels that we used before. We actually have to use something that, that is very much like soft speech, and then average converse speech, and then loud speech, or loud sounds, that loud environmental sounds, uh, so that when uh, when speech is relatively quiet, when the background noise might exceed it, the person will still be able to understand it. When it is average, like I'm speaking now, when it's about 65 dB at, at whatever position you're in, then of course it's very comfortable to them. And that loud sounds, when they go, go and leave here and go to the factory to their jobs, aren't so loud that, that the person can't wear the hearing aid in that environment. We have to make soft speech audible, average speech comfortable, and keep loud sounds from being uncomfortable. That's the goal of anything. Right? Okay. So it's important for us to um, use a speech signal as a stimulus type, uh, and to use several levels representing soft, average, and loud, right? and to make the, uh, make the measurement uh, in the ear at the eardrum level. Okay? We're verifying audibility, and that's the best process. Okay? All right, so this is the screen that you've seen of the VeriFit. And this is called an sp -elegram. Okay, And this axis, um, the vertical axis, um, is SPL, sound pressure level in dB from minus 10 dB to plus 140 dB, okay? From inaudible to loud as a jet plane taking off in front of it, okay? The whole range of, of sound levels. And this line down here, this dotted line, F, it represents the threshold of normal hearing in SPL. What would it be and where would it be if we were making the measurements in HL? Zero dB. Zero dB, right, very good. Yeah, this would be zero on an audiogram. These are the levels of sound that are the thresholds of a normal hearing person, right? This is the patient's uh, audiogram. So um, this area, is not audible to this patient. 
Anything under here is not audible to this patient because these are his thresholds. These are normal thresholds. You know? So these things under here are not audible to someone with normal hearing. This would be perfectly audible to them, but it's not audible to this patient because his hearing level is here. And then these plus signs are targets. We want to make the average speech not just audible, but comfortable, you know, which is about 10 dB at least, 10, 15 dB above threshold, right? And then these are the UCLs, uncomfortable loudness levels, all right? So we want to make sure that loud sounds don't exceed those. We're going to take speech and put it up here. It's normally going to be down here. I'm going to put it up here, okay? So this will show. Um, all right, that's normal hearing down there. There's the patient's thresholds. These are the maximum output targets. It's actually the UC UCLs, right? We don't want to exceed that. Um, so this area in here that we just shaded in, that's the usable area, all right? We have to put speech, which is down here, if it's unamplified, we have to provide the proper amount of amplification um, to put it up there. Right? And we might have to compress it. You know, a lot of times, hearing losses aren't flat like this. A lot of times, hearing losses are greatest at the high frequencies, more often than not. And so you might have a very, very uh, small range of audibility. You know, For a normal person, this is their range of audibility. They hear it when it's this, when it's this soft, and they can stand it until it's this high. But now this patient has a reduced area of audibility. Still not bad, but others will have a, a very reduced area of audibility. You have to make it this high just to be audible, and you go 10 dB higher, and now it's too loud. Okay. Uh, and so that's where compression comes in. And on these instruments, you'll even see the compression. Speech is normally about 30 dB wide from peak to valley. When it's compressed, you'll see that uh, the hearing aid could, could shift that down so it's only 10 dB wide from peak to valley. You know the peaks are? The words with, with, with accents on them. The valleys are words without accents and uh, the softer parts of, of speech. I'll show you that one around. So we would like soft speech to end up about here. Uh, you know, it's, it's still soft, so we just need it to be barely audible. So at or slightly above the threshold is where soft speech should be. Should be. What's that 50, 55 dB? Someone is speaking soft. And we want average speech, 65 dB, to be sufficiently above the threshold where it's comfortable. And we loud speech, these would be the peaks of speech, maybe speech that's 70 dB, 75. Um, want that to be uh, loud, yes, it's loud, uh, but it's nowhere near the UCLs, and loud environmental noises shouldn't be above the UCLs either, okay? And maybe just below them. You'll see this when we run it here again. Okay, um, so these things are designed so that the patient can understand this. Um, some patients you can't explain that to. New pediatrics, pediatric physics, you might explain that to the parent, but you can't explain it to the patient. And some other patients just don't have the capacity to understand this. Um, but for those who do, this is a very big uh, counseling tool, not only for uh, uh, showing benefit that there's a sales aspect, but there's also a counseling aspect. Let them know what is realistic. Uh, adjust their expectations to be appropriate. You know? uh, okay, so these things are designed so that they're easy to use, uh, and it, they give you an excellent counseling tool because the patient can understand them as well. Right? And they make for successful fittings where a patient is happy, uh, but not only happy, they're getting the, the maximum benefit. Uh, okay. So, you end up, this is the last slide. Um, you, oh, and I, you know I had a handout that I never even handed out. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, just so you'll have that, okay. 
Um, so it ends up that you are using you are using this these tools not just for fitting. Through our discussion in the last hour, we've seen that real ear measurement and specifically visible speech mapping is used for sales, but also for demonstration and demonstration of need and benefit. It's used for fitting and programming. You're, you're actually using your programming device to, met, to meet targets, to make soft sound, soft speech audible, uh, average speech comfortable, and keep loud sounds from being uncomfortable. So you're doing the fitting and programming with it. You're doing verification when you're all done. You know, you make your final run um, and let it average and save that because you now verify that you have uh, a, uh, an appropriate fitting. And you're using it for counseling. Uh, these things even have a very, very good hearing loss simulator in them. In other words, you can, if you have a family member there, and you usually like to have a family member present, um, then you can show the family member just what, demonstrate to them just what a hearing loss sounds like. George is the patient, and his daughter is there. And um, George says, I don't need a hearing aid. I'm not deaf. You people are all mumbling. Speak up. Speak clearly. Right. He says that. I am speaking up and speaking clearly, but he says that all the time. He says he doesn't need a hearing aid. He's not deaf. Well, you're right. He's not. But, and if the English language were all vowel sounds, he wouldn't need a hearing aid. Because he hears fine in the low frequencies. But what he misses are the high frequencies. He misses the consonant sounds. He hears ooh, ah, e. He doesn't even hear you when you say shh, shh, at all. Uh, and so he hears speech with those components missing, the consonant sounds missing. And here's exactly what it sounds like. And then you play a conversation that's all normal at any level that you want, just so everybody hears it and they understand it. Say, okay, now here's how George, your father, hears it. You push a button to simulate the hearing loss, and it's like, oh, they are mumbling now. No wonder he says people mumble. And that he can hear, but he can't understand. Now I get it, because I'm actually walking in his shoes, listening with his ears. You know, very powerful tool. And once you make the son, the daughter, the wife, whoever is the significant other in that person's life, when you make them advocates. Now listen, you're going to listen to Dr. Susan now. And you're going to do what she tells you. And she says you need this, then you need it. Don't tell me that people are mumbling. It's your ears. <laughs> okay. All right, so when you boot up the Verifit, it comes up like this, with this little menu. And if you hit Tests, then you get this. Um, and nobody uses that viewport, okay? Our users, which are um, almost 100% audiology users, use these two functions, test box measures and on-ear measures. And text bo test box measures means anything that you're going to, to do in the box here, rather than on the ear, okay? And in the box, you'll see that there are two microphones. Uh, two microphones right here. Uh, this little one is the reference microphone. So if somebody unplugs it on you, you plug it in where it says reference microphone. And it has a purpose. Its purpose is to regulate the output of the speaker so that it, so that at the input to the hearing aid, it is what you expect it to be. If it's supposed to be 65, it's supposed to be 70, it's supposed to be 75, 55, 50, whatever you've selected, that reference mic makes sure it regulates the output of the speaker so that you have the exact input right at the uh, microphone of the hearing aid. And then this is the coupler microphone, because we, we screw a coupler onto it. All right? And that goes into coupler mic. Uh, okay. And these two microphones get put together like this. They touch each other like that. 
And that's the position that they're in without the coupler mic on, of course, when you calibrate. So I've shut the box and I'm choosing test box measures because we'll look at some of those. And here's all the selections you could have of test box measures. In fact, one of the things is speech map. And many people, when they first see this, they say, what am I? That's supposed to do it on the ear, in the ear. Why would you do that in the test box? Well, if you were a pediatric audiologist and you were at Children's Hospital in Birmingham, you would have a Verifit and you would be fitting almost all of your patients using that. You'd be in the test box uh, because you couldn't put that tube in the 18 months old ear and say, sit still, shut up, don't move, don't breathe. You understand? And have to say, yes ma'am. <laughs> and like that, and maybe hold that for 30 minutes or so. No, I won't do it. You know, one time when autoacoustic emissions first came out, when it was very, very sensitive to noise, it's sensitive to noise today, but it was worse when it first came out, believe me. So, on pediatric patients, um, we do it in the, in the test box. And you'd say, you would normally say, oh, well, that's crazy. So you're going to use this metal coupler. And this coupler, you're, you're going to have the hearing aid in this instead of the ear. And you're going to fit the hearing aid to this. Well, this isn't the patient's ear. Um, this isn't even close. It's not even the right size. This is nuts. How is this going to be an accurate measurement? This is a, a steel 2cc coupler. This patient's ear is probably a half a cc and it's flesh and blood, it's not steel. How could it, how could it be? Well, um, there is a thing called real ear to coupler difference. And I heard you've been measuring real ear to coupler differences and that's good. Um, and um, if you knew the difference between the response of that patient 18 months old if you knew the response of their ear, and you knew the response of this, then the machine, you could say bye-bye patient, and fit them accurately in here, because the machine can simulate the ear in this, now that it knows the difference. You know? So that's great, and that's why, that's the purpose for real ear, uh, for real ear coupler difference. Anyway, uh, if they can't do that even, then they choose the age of the patient, and they use the average real ear to coupler difference. And the reason that the averages are good is because they were done at the University of Western Ontario with Richard Seewald and his group, very well known, over decades with tens of thousands of kids. The numbers are so high, the N is so high in this research project that it's now perfected. DSL 5.0, when you choose the age, you have a very, very solid average, really a couple of difference that's applied for that age. Um, and so it's considered good. Now, so that's why speech mapping is on here, because it's simulated uh, really a measurement, simulated visible speech mapping in a couple. Okay? Mainly for pediatric fittings. Uh, and then the, there are, whoops, I didn't want to do that. Uh, so I'm going back to this. Uh, this uh, these two are running a sequence of tests. They are an ANSI, uh, that's American National Standards Institute, sequence of tests with uh, gain curves, output curves, uh, distortion measurements, measurement of uh, of overall gain, measurement of frequency response, measurement of attack and release time, which is a specification of compression. Um, um, and I know that you do those sequences here. Um, and they do have their benefit. Um, and I'll show you those, we'll run those on a hearing aid. But I want to show you some of these other things that are commonly used and what their benefits are. Um, and so, Let's start with directional here, okay? Well, so I'm using my hearing aid here. Um, this is an Oticon Epoch. It's not their latest hearing aid now. Um, but Oticon was good enough to give it to me and I really like it. Um, okay, so 
some hearing aids have a feature of directional micro... Well, no, let's not do that first. Um, sorry. I'm going to do this multi-curve first. All right, so I chose the multi-curve and my first measurement. Now, there I am at 50 dB, and I will... Alright, so there's, there's the uh, gain of this hearing aid with a 50 dB input, okay? This is the gain. Uh, well, what do you suppose would happen if I change that to a 60 dB input? Uh, a 70 dB. And finally, I want to do a, a um, I'm trying to do an, an, uh, an 80 dB input. Okay. Notice when I went to 80 dB, the gain went down. Right? That's what I'm typically expecting with compression is as I increase the input to the hearing aid, the gain goes down. The gain is how much amplification there is. What's the difference between uh, no hearing aid in the ear and then hearing aid in place, right? How much, how much difference is there? Uh, that's the gain. That would be called insertion gain. That if it was done in the ear, here we're not in the ear, we're in the coupler. But what I'm proving by doing this is that the compression is working. Uh, now, I'm not getting much compression up here until I go to higher levels with this particular hearing aid, just the way it's programmed. Uh, but I want to see what the manufacturer tells me I expect to see, because they all publish a series of curves like this, very typically 50, D, 50 60, 70, 80 dB, at least four, and they show that as the, as the input signal level increases, the gain of the hearing aid decreases. Right? Because you need more gain at low levels to hear it, you want less gain at high levels. Right? Uh, so that makes sense. That's the multi-curve function, and many people use that, and they compare those curves with what the manufacturer publishes. Not only the shape of them, but uh, the, the fact that, that they, uh, they decreased gain when the signal was increased. All right, I'm going back to the test box measures now to choose another measurement. And here would be a, another very appropriate one to do in many cases, and that's distortion. Distortion has to do with fidelity. How does the hearing aid sound? How clean is it? How clear is it? Patients will talk like that. Clean, clear, crisp, uh, or they'll say garbled, distorted, not clear muffled, right? Um, and you might listen to the hearing aid if they bring it in with this complaint. You might listen to it and it might sound, hey, it sounds okay to me. All you could hear would be really gross distortion. Uh, but they might have a complaint of fine distortion because they've been wearing this every day. They're tuned into it. Uh, and now they hear a difference. Okay, so this is a perfect thing to do. We're at 65 dB, and when I hit start, it's going to measure the amount of distortion at all these frequencies from 250 to 4,000 hertz, and they're in one-third octaves. So this is a beautiful way to test the fidelity of a hearing aid. Very appropriate. Uh, all right, 65 dB, I'm going to hit continue. And that's exactly what I expected from this good digital hearing aid. I expected very low, very, very low uh, distortion. Zeros and ones at conversational speech levels. Well, then you say to the patient, well, you know, this has very, very low distortion. This is clean. It is clear. Um, and they'll go, well, yes, it is. When we're in here just talking like this, 
But when I go into the office, I can't understand anybody. It's all muffled. Um, it's distorted. But in the, what's the difference in the office is people are yelling. They're speaking up like I'm speaking up here. Um, maybe not at 65, maybe at 80. They're all yelling. Why are they yelling? Because there's noise all around them. There's copy machines going. There's people talking. Um, there's, there are printers printing. And so uh, everybody kind of speaks up to get over the background noise. Okay, well, let's run it again, but this time, let's simulate that situation. So I'm coming down to the level, and I'm going to turn it up from conversational speech, 65 dB, to 80 dB. And now when I do, am I going to find that the distortion goes through the roof? And there's the answer to the question, right? Okay, let's see. Well, actually we do have a culprit right here. What do you expect on a good digital hearing aid, even in an 80 dB input, you are expecting uh, distortions to be 5% or less. On the old hearing aids, we used to say 10% or less, you know. Uh, but here we have an 11. We have a little mountain of distortion that could be what the person is complaining about. Actually, that's not even that bad. I've seen it where it's way up here. This is 25%. And the thing will rescale uh, where you, you could have even greater amounts. All right? But it's a really good test of fidelity. You have to be quiet when you do it so you're not adding distortion from the outside. Okay? Uh, but that's what that test is all about. THD just means total harmonic distortion. Okay? So it's not just measuring distortion at the fundamental frequency. That's the frequency being tested. But all distortion is actually producing harmonics, unwanted sounds. Distortion is unwanted sounds. Uh, and they are harmonics of the fundamental frequency, which is the test frequency. Okay. So total harmonic distortion is all distortion. Okay. So uh, I'm going back to my, my list of tests. And now we, we saw multi-curve and its purpose. And we saw distortion and its purpose. And let's see about noise reduction. Okay? Sometimes hearing aids have a feature of noise reduction. They all do. Uh, some more or less. Some are effective. Some are ineffective. But what if the patient were sitting on the couch having a conversation in the living room with several people, and somebody comes in, maybe it's the lobby of a hotel, and somebody comes along with a vacuum cleaner. Ah, well, what should the hearing aid do? You would hope it would recognize that that's a vacuum cleaner and not speech, and it would reduce that vacuum cleaner. Okay. So the beauty of this test is you can actually do that. You could put a vacuum cleaner right in there with this box and see what the hearing aid does about it. Okay. Some that are supposed to have noise uh, reduction do nothing, uh, and some do a lot. Some do a little. Uh, and it's a really good way to, to demonstrate to yourself and others uh, the effectiveness of noise reduction. Okay. So I'm going to choose the first test. And there's air conditioner in there. I don't want an air conditioner. I want a vacuum cleaner because it's more drastic. And how loud is a vacuum cleaner? About 80. 80 is loud. All right. Here goes. What's one thing? Gonna hit continue. No, start testing. There it is. Okay. Now that curve that you see there is the instantaneous curve. As soon as the vacuum cleaner started playing, uh, that, that thick curve was produced. This is before the hearing aid realizes that it's noise and does something about it. But in a few seconds, the hearing aid realizes that it is noise, and that thin line is the ongoing vacuum cleaner. The thick one was the instantaneous when it first came on. And now we're hoping that, that, that the hearing aid reduces the noise. In some hearing aids, you'll see that come right down. Uh, after maybe five, ten seconds, you see a drastic change. 
Some have more of a change than others, and it also depends on how it's programmed. But once you're done, you can hit continue and, and freeze that. So that's the amount of noise reduction. Uh, and especially in the lower frequencies like this. Okay. Uh, so that's a uh, that's a a good practical test. You know, uh, if if a, a, some clinics dispense several different makes and models of hearing aids, maybe Resound, Oticon, Siemens, uh, and others. And uh, if one good thing that you one might do is something like this, um, because in to know which hearing aids that you have available to you are the best performers in different situations. Sometimes this might be very, very important. You have a school kid. The kid's sitting up front and the other kids are making noise. And, and uh, what you're trying to do is create the best signal to noise ratio. You know? You want to have a directional microphone that's picking up from the front and not the kids blabbing in the back. You also want noise reduction so that uh, when, when noise is taking place, it is effectively reduced so as to maintain the best signal to noise ratio. And so you might find that certain makes and models are more effective than others. Uh, it's a good test to do. Uh, and so the models that you know, because you were able to demonstrate it, are more effective on this feature would be the ones you'd recommend for this kind of patient. You know, where this is a factor. Somebody living in a nursing home where noise isn't an issue, maybe it doesn't make any difference. Okay, so now I'm going back to my test and I'm going to select something different. Um, how about this directional thing? This is for hearing aids that have directional microphones. Very important for that kid now because we want it to pick up from the front and uh, and to actually attenuate what's going on in the back. Uh, so there's directionality. If you look at the person speaking to you, um, then that, that is what is going to uh, be processed most effectively by the hearing aid. And other sounds coming from other directions will be attenuated. Sometimes this is very effective. Sometimes it is zero effect. Sometimes it's the opposite effect. Everybody reports having uh, directional microphones that were directional in the wrong direction. That's because usually the manufacturer uses two microphones to make this happen. One is picking up from the front of the patient. One is picking up from the, behind the patient. And it uses a combination of the two to, to effectively be directional. Okay. Uh, well, what if those two microphones were miswired? The front one is now the back one, and the back one is the front one, in the way they were wired. So now the patient hears better from the back than the front. You have created just the opposite, uh, and the patient goes to school every day. And the kid in back is snoring and everything else, and <laughs> that's creating a, a poor signal-to-noise ratio. Okay, so let's see how we can do this. Uh, I'm going to uh, maybe turn this up to a conversational level. And now you actually have two signals being played. One that is coming out of one speaker, that's the front speaker, and one's coming out of the, uh, the back speaker, the other speaker, which is the rear speaker. And it actually is 128 modulated pure tones, like warble tones, uh, 24, 64 of which are coming out of one speaker and the other 64 from the other speaker. And the relationship is like this between those frequencies. And the machine can tell them apart. So that's why it can create two curves. So, of course, it's important how I have the hearing aid oriented. In fact, I might wonder how I'm supposed to have it oriented, so let me show you something. I'm going to hit cancel for the moment, and then hit help. Okay? And I want to know how to position a BTE in there for this. Right? So when I push help, it brought me right to the area of whatever test I'm on, 
and I was able to just go down and see how that's supposed to be positioned in there to make sure that if I'm doing this directional test that I have, I have this set appropriately. And I do, so I'll hit cancel to get out, and I'll go back to where I was. Okay, so the thick curve is the front speaker, and the thin curve is the rear speaker. And actually, I don't see any difference. So there's very little, there's at this moment in here, there is very little directional effect. If I saw a big separation between the thick and the thin, the thick one being front and the thin one being the rear, then I would know there was a lot of directional effect, right? difference between front and rear. Okay? Uh, and it may be shut off in the programming of this, for that matter, because it actually works good when it's on in here. But that can happen too. It could, it could simply be that uh, the hearing aid is fine, but whatever the feature you're trying to measure is inadvertently turned off in the programming software. Okay. Uh, so that's a, that's a good feature. Okay, back to the tests. And what about feedback? We can maybe make this happen so I can explain how this works. Um, in order to, 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 to show you what happens here, I've got to have the headset, there's a little headset that can plug in inside of this. Um, and I've got to have that to be able to demonstrate this particular feature. Uh, anybody know where that is? What I'm doing here is I'm going to force the hearing aid to feed back. Yep, it worked. Alright. So I'm going to go to the feedback test and select it. Um, and now I'm going to start this. And I have the headset shut off. There's a little volume control where the headset is plugged in. And I have this all the way down. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to hit continue now. And it's averaging speech at 65 dB. This is a paragraph of speech. It's averaging that. This is with no feedback reduction taking place. And then after I get that, I'm going to make the hearing aid feedback. And then while the feedback suppression is engaged, I'm going to average speech again to see if there's any difference. You know, Sometimes, um, especially in, in the past, feedback reduction means finding the frequency of the feedback loop and then cutting a piece out of the pie where that, where that frequency was. All right, now you're missing a component of speech because you're, you're reducing those frequencies. Uh, there are much better techniques now. Uh, but let's see how this goes. So I'm now turning up the level of that headset until I start to get feedback. Oh, wait, I, I, have to, I have to play it, of course. All right, so I'm turning it up. Now you start seeing a little bit of feedback here, see? I turn it up slowly. All right, we had feedback, and the feedback was suppressed, you know? The reason this didn't come and stay like that is because the feedback suppression suppressed it, okay? See, here's full feedback. Now, we can't suppress that. I turned it up all the way. You can see the fundamental frequency and the harmonics of the feedback right here. Okay? Uh, but I don't want to do that. I, I want to uh, just turn it up slowly until it starts. There it starts. And then let the feedback suppression take place. I turned it up too much. can't do that. You have to just, just till it just starts. And then, see that? I turned up a little bit more and, and it's and it's suppressed. I can't overdo it. I, I have to make it realistic. Alright, so now the feedback suppression is engaged. It's keeping the hearing aid from feeding back. And I'm going to hit continue again. And it's going to average that curve. And the two curves we see is the average of speech without feedback suppression engaged, and the average of speech with the feedback in, uh, suppression engaged. 
And if there's no difference between the two, that's perfect. Okay? That means that the feedback suppression hasn't affected the response of speech. In some hearing aids it will. And if it does, that's bad. And the, the more different, the worse it is. Well, there's the two curves. There's a little reduction in level, uh, but that's the only difference. When you say, uh, or like mention, I guess it, the output, is that, are you talking about the output of speech, like the gain that you get? Well, it's not gain. This is, this is just actual, the, this, is, this is the actual level of speech, okay? Uh, over the range, the complete range of frequencies from 250 to 8,000, this is the level. See, this, this, is, this is around 80 dB, the lows are around 70 dB. It's just, um, it will have an average of 65. Oh, look, this was done, I did that wrong because it was at 60. I wanted to do that at 65, the same level. So I should come down here uh, and make that 65 and do it over again. Uh, but yes, it's, it's, it's just the, the average output level of speech. We've, we, we're taking speech and we're doing a spectral analysis on it. You know, We actually even see a peak in it at 2,000 because of the hearing aid response. Um, but look, it's even better. When we equalize the input, uh, there is essentially no difference between uh, how it processed speech uh, with feedback reduction engaged and without feedback reduction engaged. Um, if, if we saw a big notch right here, then, then, then we would have something significant that we'd have to, have to deal with. Okay. That's, that was the purpose of that test. Let me show you one more thing before we go to real ear measurement. Uh, and that is battery drain and telecoil, if we have something with the telecoil. Uh, now I have to use a different hearing aid than mine. We can have this back. But that works pretty easily. Uh, you're just forcing the hearing aid into feedback with that. So I'm going to use the Siemens hearing aid that you brought. Ah, good. And a battery pill. So, if somebody was to bring a hearing aid to you and say it's eating batteries, and I hear this all the time, uh, anybody dispensing hearing aids hears this complaint. I was in somebody's office yesterday, actually it was Audiological Consultants of Atlanta, they're a big, uh, they're probably the, the biggest dispenser of hearing aids in metropolitan Atlanta. Uh, and they, uh, I, would, I was in their office, I was just sitting in their waiting room because I was waiting. Um, they had just ordered two of those Axioms and, um, and they were having problems with their Verifit. And she says, hey, I'm ordering two Axioms, come fix my Verifit, all right? So I said, all right, if I have to. And I brought this, my demo down, and I took the unit back because it's intermittent, we couldn't make it do it. But anyway, um, I, um, while I was sitting in the waiting room, a patient came up and said, this hearing aid is eating batteries. You know, um, and and I, I can't stand it. It's costing me a mint to buy batteries all the time. They're not lasting long enough. They used to last a lot longer. Well, how would you know? Again, you, would, you could, you could uh, listen to the hearing aid. How does it sound? If it all sounded distorted and rotten, you'd say, well, there's something wrong with it. I'm sending it back to the factory. Um, but you have, you have no way, no objective way of confirming that it is eating batteries or isn't eating batteries. And you can do nothing uh, unless you're able to run this test. So I put a battery pill in. This, this substitutes for the battery uh, that's in the hearing aid. And that plugs in where it says battery pill. And we start the test. And let me, I'll let it run and then, uh, uh, we got nothing. So, for some reason, uh, well, the hearing aid was off, that's why. 
Makes sense, right? It's got to be turned on. Alright, doing that over again. This is the best possible indicator of what's called battery drain that you can do. Because what we just did, and all we did is put the we all we did is put the the battery pill, a battery simulator, into the hearing aid to replace the battery, and that's plugged in where it says battery pill. And then the instrument tested the amount of current that's drawn by the hearing aid under three vastly different conditions. Okay? The three conditions are quiescent, 1000 Hz at 65 dB, and then uh, an average at 90 dB. Okay, what's quiescent mean? Quiescent is an engineering term which means no signal being processed. Quiescent, no signal being processed. Right? In the case of a hearing aid, it's quiet, okay? No signal being processed by the hearing aid. Um, so it measures the amount of current being drawn by the hearing aid from that battery, how much is being sucked out of that battery when, they're, when it's quiet. Might be more than you think. That hearing aid is in its greatest gain when it has the lowest input, right? So that's significant. Also, how much how much current is being sucked out of the battery by the hearing aid when we're at conversational level, 1,000 hertz is 65 dB, just representing conversational speech. And then what if um, you're in a loud environment, 90 dB, you know? And if a hearing aid has good current regulation, then we can go to these three extremes of conditions and measure approximately the same amount of current, you know? On old hearing aids, if we had a 20-year-old hearing aid and put it in there, you would notice that at loud levels, this would be up off the chart, you know? That's poor current regulation. And so, if you found out that at loud levels, the current drain was way up relative to the other two, and the guy said to you, so well, when did it start eating batteries? Oh, ever since I started working at the factory. Is it loud in the factory? Oh, yeah. You wear your hearing aid in there? Yeah, else well, so I wouldn't hear anything. Okay, that's what it is. You know, it is, uh, it, it, it's that the current, the current drain is excessive when uh, they're for a loud input. Uh, but on today's hearing aids, these should all be close to the same. Here they are, 1.05, 1.06, 1.08. That's great. Uh, it's great because they're very close to each other, even though the, they're extremely different inputs. Uh, so that shows good regulation. And then is this number appropriate, you know? Um, I can give you some generalizations. If you have a moderate gain hearing aid, it should be about one milliamp. The current drain should be about one milliamp on a, on a hearing aid with moderate gain. On a high, high, super high gain, you're going to put on somebody with a, with a severe hearing loss, you might have two milliamps. So it's going to be somewhere between one and two milliamps, depending on how powerful the hearing aid is. Moderate power, about, a, about one million. Power blaster that you put on a, a deaf kid uh, that goes to Alabama School for the Deaf, um, well, they're going to be around two milliamps. The, ma the manufacturer of every hearing aid specifies what the current drain should be for 1,000 hertz to 65 dB. With that input that they specify, this manufacturer probably specifies one milliamp of battery drain at 1,000 hertz is 65 dB with that input. Uh, that's all they're going to tell you, but you're, you're actually going above and beyond what the manufacturer says. You look mainly at this number, but then you look at these two things too, because this is significant, because a compression hearing aid many times has maximum gain at lowest input level, and others could be saturated and everything else at high levels. So uh, this is good current regulation. And then you have a way to 
to counsel the patient. Um, you put in here what kind of battery it is, like this is a number 13 zinc air battery, okay? And how many hours a day is the patient wearing it, you know? Um, so let's say he says he wears it 18 hours a day. Well, this is going to tell him the estimated battery life. Well, that's going to last nine days. And if you if you wear it under these conditions, if, if you uh, under normal conditions, uh, if if you wear it uh, 18 hours a day, you'll get about nine days out of the battery. Uh, to, to in order to give the person a realistic expectation of what they expect, maybe they're expecting too much. Maybe there's nothing wrong at all with the hearing aid. It's, it's, the battery drain is what it's supposed to be, except that they're buying batteries online that have been sitting around for five years. Right? The battery has a shelf life. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so these were all use, pretty useful things. Um, it, it was directional is for uh, validating the effectiveness of directional microphones for hearing aids who have that feature. The, the amount of uh, effect in the response of speech of feedback suppression. The effectiveness of noise reduction. A measurement of distortion would give us a, a measurement of fidelity or lack of it. Uh, Multi-curve, we can see the general gain response of the hearing aid as well as a reduction of gain as we increase uh, levels of input. That's a family of curves that's, that uh, every manufacturer publishes for every make of hearing aid. Uh, and battery drain, we can see how that's necessary. This hearing aid has a telecoil, so since it does, I'm going to put it in the telecoil mode and show you how we would check that. Okay, um, and so now I'm going to telecoil. Telecoil is important for hear for a hearing aid patients that are on the telephone a lot. You have a business person uh, who wears a hearing aid and it just has to work on the telephone, and so he uses the telecoil. It's important to him. Well, some telecoils are terrible. Certain makes and models of hearing aids, the telecoil is almost unusable. But you have no way of knowing that. And on some of them, it's exquisite. But with this feature, you can test the telecoils, and you can determine which makes and models uh, have a better telecoil than others. Uh, so in the bottom of the box, there is an area. Of course, it's, it's, it's worn off of here. Uh, but there's an area where you test the hearing aid normally, and there's another area with a T on it. It's supposed to be a T on it that uh, is used for telecoil, and it, it doesn't use an acoustic signal, it uses an inductive signal, right? So it's, a, it's an electromagnetic induction rather than an acoustic from a speaker, right? Uh, so you hit start right here. This is a new term, so I don't know what that, maybe somebody knows what that is supposed to mean here, it's the telecoil test. It's a, it's a new term, and I, I, uh, I never looked that up. But when you engage it by pressing this button, um, it tells you to couple the hearing aid uh, and to set the hearing aid in the RTP, reference test gain position, reference test position. Well, for me, that's how the patient's going to wear it because that's what really matters. I have this, this hearing aid adjusted to how the patient's going to wear it in the real world, and I want to see how the telecoil works. All right? Make sure it's, the telecoil's on. All right? Uh, and press continue. So, I'm now moving the hearing aid around in the area where the telecoil is, my T area. Now, I'm moving it around because I don't know, and I'm moving it around until I get the highest number right here. Because I don't know where the telecoil is in this. You don't know. It could be here. It could be there, it could be here, it could be there. I don't know where it is. I, I can guess where it is because I know it's not where the volume control is, it's not where the battery door is, but I don't really know where it is. So I'm moving this around on the floor of this test box area in where the T is 
and you should get a new foam pad for this so that that because it's just worn off, you know. Uh, and when I have the air, highest number there, I have the strongest inductive field. And the manufacturer gives you one thing. All the manufacturer does is tell you that number. So you can look at the manufacturer's number for telecoil. That's, that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to have a, a value of 80 dB. Fine. Okay. And that means with 1,000 hertz at, at, at a, a, a certain current level put through the, um, the inductive coil that's under that pad, it produces 80 dB. Good. But here's something better you can do. Yes, check that number and see if that's close to what the manufacturer says it's supposed to be. But then run this. And it's going to run a curve on the telecoil. And if that curve looks like the microphone curve, then perfect. Okay? Your number is good. And your curve looks like the microphone curve. The patient's going to love the telecoil and use it, and it's going to be efficacious for them. Right? It's going to have a good effect. Uh, if if number is good, but this looks rotten, <laughs> you know, um, then um, rotten. What would rotten look like? All right, I can make a rotten one. I just move that out of place, and so if I started it again, got the number, hit continue. Oh, even that looks pretty good. I didn't even try. Okay, I had it. I didn't have it in the best place. Uh, you know, the highest gain. Put it in the highest place. But um, I've seen telecoil curves that do this. I've seen them that go. Huh? They have a dip where the peak should be. All kinds of things that just just crazy. All right. But once you get used to looking and hearing the curves, you know right away. Especially if you've looked at the microphone curves on this, like in the multi-curve. Uh, function, then you can very easily see that this is appropriate. Okay. Uh, you normally don't get that. What you get is a number. All right. That makes sense. Did all those things make sense? Because they were. That's not where this thing shines. They're all just the. They're, they're the icing on the cake. Now we're going to do the cake itself. All right. All right. So it's three o'clock. Do you want to take a? Do you guys want to take a break, or you want to keep going? You want it. You want it. All right. So take. Now we'll shift to what we do on the ear. If we were doing visible speech mapping in the box, it would be the same as on the ear. So uh, when you learn one, you learn the other. The only difference is when you're here, whether you do speech mapping from by selecting test box measures or on the ear measures. Okay. So I'm going to on the ear measures. And then I'm going to make sure I choose speech map here. I can do some of those other things like feedback, noise reduction, directional microphone on the ear, but that would be difficult. It's, um, it's, you have less control of it. It's better to do those tests of function in the test box. Okay. Uh, and um, so Everybody's familiar with the SPLogram, and the only thing that's on it to begin with, which is the level of uh, the threshold of normal hearing, and all of this has to be filled out for each hearing aid. So the way you typically start is to go up to the top and, and answer these questions. The first one is what type of instrument is it? Is it a BTE behind the ear, or is it an ITE in the ear, ITC in the canal, CIC completely in the canal, or what? If it is an open fit, then we have to say open fit. The open fit is going to be treated differently than all of the other types of hearing aids. When open fits first became popular, um, there was a problem. When people tried to do real ear measurement on them, they, they wound up with a major, major problem. And they said, hey, they just don't look good. There's something wrong. Uh, my open fits, I can't do um, real ear measurement on. And uh, it was soon discovered what the problem was. And this is what it is. These systems are self-regulating. 
Remember I told you that in the box there is a reference microphone which you physically place as close as you can to the microphone on the hearing aid because it's controlling the input to the hearing aid. Uh, well, in real ear measurement, there's also a reference microphone. It's right here on this little module. And this should be, this should be placed on the ear so that it's pointed out, not in, towards the person's face. But this little microphone right there is uh, the reference microphone when you're in the real ear mode. And it controls the output of the speaker, which is now this, instead of the speakers in here. Uh, and the problem is that in an open fit, you don't have a seal in the ear. So amplified sound leaks out of the ear. And if it leaks out of the ear, where does it go? It goes right there to the reference microphone. The reference microphone is acting like a sound bubble meter. It's measuring the stimulus. And it so that if you chose 65 dB, it would be 65 dB at the ear. And if the patient was to get up and walk over to that wall, the output of the speaker would increase to make 65 dB back there. It's controlling it, so there's always 65 dB or whatever level you choose at the patient's ear. That's a regulated system, okay? And that's what these are, and it's good, because if the patient moves, you know, if he starts out sitting here, and, and halfway through the measurement, he's sitting like this, well, that's okay, it doesn't matter, because it's regulated. And this system is forcing the proper level right to his ear. But in an open fit, when am amplified sound is leaking out of the ear and getting to the reference microphone, the reference, mi reference microphone is saying, it's too loud, turn it down. Okay, but it's not measuring the output of the speaker, it's measuring what's leaking out of the ear, amplified sound. So that was the problem. So the manufacturer, well, not all of them, but this one for sure, they got smart enough to change their software, and when you choose open fit, before you start to run a curve of fitting, it's actually going to put a test signal out and it's going to calibrate just where you are. It's going to use the, the reference mic for two seconds to calibrate, and then it's going to shut it off. Now the patient can't get up anymore and walk away or slouch over like this. He has to stay in that position because he's calibrated in that position. But provided that he does that, the reference microphone is off, and that effect is gone the effect of amplified sound reaching the reference microphone. It does reach the reference microphone, but the reference microphone is no longer needed to shut off. Okay? That's important to know. So, uh, because some systems don't have that. They, they fit a BTE, they treat a BTE and a CIC and, a, and an ITC and, uh, and an open fit all the same. And that's, that induces an error. Okay. Uh, all right, so I chose open fit here, right? And then, how are we going to do it? On the ear? Yes. The other choice would be in the test box, which would be simulated real ear measurement. And you, can, you cannot do simulated real ear measurement with an open fit. You cannot do simulated real ear measurement with an open fit. It is against the law. It's a mortal sin. You go straight to hell. <laughs> can't do it. And audio scan doesn't let you do it. Uh, so, uh, and why do you think that is? Um, it's in a closed environment, isn't it? Well, it, it, because, it, because it's not, there's no seal in the ear. And because there's no seal in the ear, sound enters through the hearing aid, but also through the ear, you know. Uh, and if you did it in a coupler, it would be sealed in the coupler. The only way sound would enter the coupler, which is supposed to be simulating the ear, is through the hearing aid. Wouldn't enter any other way. So it's not the same. You can't do simulated real ear measurement in a coupler when it's an open fit. And so typically you don't put open fits on pediatric patients. You actually make them an ear mold and they have a BTE. Uh, and, uh, and you fit them like that. Okay, so so uh, if it wasn't an open fit, if it was a BTE, for example, then we could change this to test box. In other words, now I'm doing simulated real measurement in the test box. All right. 
But when you are on an open fit, when you're on, on whoops, when you're on an open fit, you see what? It's not letting me do that. Open fittings may not be verified in the test box. Well, let you do it. So I have to hit continue. And uh, if I'm using an open fit, uh, I've got to change this to on the ear. And now it'll let me select open fit. So that was important to know. This is single view or dual view. If I hit this, I can get a dual view, which looks like that. And why would that be good? Well, if you're fitting a hearing aid on both ears, and both ears have the same audiogram, most of the time you do, not always, but um, then you want the fitting to be about the same between ears. Because if one is real good and the other is rotten, then the patient says, I don't need both hearing aids. I hear better with just this one. That would be the good one. You know? And and so you know, as a clinician, it would be better for that person to have two ears. Uh, that's why it was designed with two ears to begin with. Okay? Uh, but because you made the results asymmetrical, the patient is favoring the good one and saying he only wants that one. Take the other one back and give him my money back for that one. Okay? So that's why it's good. You can't do them both at the same time. But you can put them both up there when they're done and see that they're symmetrical side by side. That's why that mode is there. I'm not going to use it because we can see better when it's just one at a time. But I wanted to tell you why it had a dual mode. The next thing down is graph. Because it's either going to show a graph or it's going to show a table. You want a graph. A table is a bunch of numbers which aren't going to mean anything to you. The graph is a tracing. Okay? And we would normally want to do this in SPL instead of HL. You could do it in HL, right? Where this line is now going to be a line in zero. Okay? It's just that if you showed that to me in HL or anybody else, they would say, what is that? It would be, you know, they just they, the, the professional world of electroacoustic measurements of hearing aids knows everything in SPL, even though audiograms are done in HL. And some people say, well, I'd like to do it in HL because I just taught my patient how to understand the audiogram, and now I'm going to turn things upside down on them. Well, the audiogram is what it's upside down. This is normal. And the whole hearing aid world thinks like this. And it's not that hard to explain to patients what this means anyway, even if you just explain the audiogram. So this is always left in SPL, though they gave you that because there are some people who insisted on it. And you'd have to get used to it like that. I'm certainly not used to it in HL. All right, so you're just going to answer these five questions. Uh, and then come to audiometry. When you come to audiometry, you're, you're pushing this bar, right? Um, and that opens up this, this group of things. And so um, the first thing is a target. And you could use no target. Many users of the Verifit use no target. The reason why no target is, is a possibility I'm sure you won't do it here, but the reason it's a possibility is because you know what's not audible. You know, you know what is audible. You know what's too loud. And some people don't like targets. They just say, hey, I'm going to take speech, and I'm going to make soft speech audible. I'm going to make average speech comfortable by making it 10, 15 dB over the threshold, and then I'm going to make, uh, make sure loud sounds are not uncomfortable. That's okay. And if, if, if that's, if, if that's, um, um, if, if that's their method, that's, that's fine. But what you will typically do on an adult is choose NL1. Uh, and NAL is, uh, uh, what is it? National Acoustics Lab, right? Okay. Uh, and this is a result of 
uh, again, years and years of work uh, with different configurations of sensory neural hearing losses to come up with what is a prescription, an ideal prescription. If we can make a measurement in the ear with the hearing aid on the patient with this loss, where would we want it to? Where would we want that response to be? What, what would we want the output of the hearing aid to be? So NL1 for an adult, typically, or DSL child. If I'm if, if I have a child, then I would um, be choosing this. All right. And normally you'd be doing these uh, in the test box because the child wants to sit still for it. But once I choose DSL child, look at this. I can now choose the age of that child and look at this one month increments all the way down to one, two, three months of age, you know. And I say each one of these increments has got thousands of, of kids in it to determine the best average possible. Uh, and again, it's the North American average um, in, uh, for, for RECD, really a couple of different. In order to make you doing a real ear measurement without the ear, you're doing it in a coupler. Well, how is that valid? Only if you have an RECD. Because if you do, you know the response of the coupler, you know the response of the ear, you don't need the patient anymore. You can simulate it in a coupler. All right, so um, we're, we'll just say adult here. Um, and I'm going to change this back to NL1. Uh, and now, how did you test the patient? How did you come up with the thresholds? Did you do them with headphones? Or did you do them with inserts? Did you do them, when you did them with inserts, did you use the yellow foam thing? Or did you use the patient's ear mold instead of the yellow foam thing? Uh, or did you use sound field? You know, so you would choose how you did this. Um, the reason why is every audiogram, especially when you fit a child, is wrong. Some are more wrong than others. If you use a headphone, it is certainly wrong. The audiogram you did, even though you did it perfectly, just like you've been taught, and the audiometer is calibrated perfectly, the audiogram is wrong. I'll tell you why. Because when we calibrate headphones, we calibrate them in a 6cc coupler, a metal coupler with a volume of 6ccs. The reason is 6ccs, centimeters, is because that represents the area under the cushion of an adult ear, the average adult ear. That's the concha and the ear canal together. And if you average all of the adults in the world, you get about 6ccs. Okay. But you're doing a child. It's not six cc's. You're lucky if it's three cc's. So if, if, if I made a sound in this room, if I set up a speaker and a signal generator and an amplifier, and I set up a, a sound, and I made it 70 dB, okay? And we measured it, it was 70 dB. And then I took this wall, and I moved this wall all the way over to the set where the center of this room is now, where that, um, that air conditioning uh, gauge is the, the thermostat. Now, do you think we would still have 70 dB? No. Would we have more or less? More. More. more because we made the volume much smaller. Right? Well, that's, that's the case in a child's ear when we use headphones. The audiogram is wrong. Uh, when you use inserts, it's better. It's better because now it's calibrated in the 2cc cavity, which is supposed to, we're not, you don't care about the concha now, it's just the ear canal. But still, it's not good on a kid because it, it, his, his ear canal is not 2cc's, it's 1cc or maybe a half a cc. And so you still have a problem. It's not as bad because there's less variance when, than there is with the concha involved. All right. Um, but what I'm saying is it's wrong. Well, what does this software do? It fixes it. You put in the age of the child, you put nine months old in, and it says, oh yeah, that audiogram's wrong. I'm going to fix it. And so it corrects it. That's why you're doing this. All right.
doesn't matter so much if you're actually making the measurement. Okay. Uh, bulk conduction is either not applicable or enter. Uh, not applicable means there's no bone component to this hearing loss. Uh, it's just a sensory neural hearing loss. There's no conductive component. If there was a substantial conductive component where this is going to actually make a difference, then go ahead and put enter there and it'll make you enter the bone conduction scores as well. All right? Um, most of the time you leave that on the NA. UCL is either enter or average. So you either measure the UCLs with tones uh, or you're going to put leave it on average. RECD can either be average, in other words, use the average for the age of the patient that you put in, enter because I've already measured it. When I made the, when I made the ear mold, I measured the RECD really a couple of difference, and I changed this from a graph to a table, and I printed it out. Now I have it. I know that at 250, the really a couple of difference is 10. I know at 1,000, it's 5. I know at 4,000, it's minus 2, or whatever it is, okay? I'll know that, uh, and I can enter them in, or measure. I, I want to actually measure them. I'm going to, for now, I'm going to show you really a couple of difference, but I'm going to leave that on average for now. Uh, and if it's a binaural fitting, put yes in there. When you're done, hit continue, and you're ready to put the audiogram in. So it's simply a matter of doing this. I'm going to put something reasonable in there. There. And hit continue. Alright, so now we have our perfect sp -allogram. Normal hearing, um, this is the patient's threshold, and this is uncomfortable loudness level. Now, if I wanted to demonstrate to the patient the need for a hearing aid, this is a good time to do it. All I did is hang this on my ear. Just hung it on my ear, adjusted it up. I don't even have the tube in. And I can do something very effective if I want to now. Uh, Oh, look at this. Equalize. Why did that come on? Because I'm in the open ear, I'm in the uh, open fit. This only appears in the open fit. Other than that, you don't need this. Because at some point you calibrated this. To calibrate it means that you took the tube, the little tube that goes in the ear, and there are two posts that you can put those through. Um, and you hold it close to that speaker, and you can, um, let's see if I, I, well, I can't do it now. I gotta let it equalize. So I'm gonna, so we calibrate it. Okay, uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm not, this is not, this is not the way to do this. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop and show you the difference. Um, Normally, when we calibrate, we hold, we put that tube over the reference mic, hold this maybe a foot away from the speaker, and go. And you should have a curve, something like that. All right, that's just the response to this system. Uh, but when we're in this particular test. <coughs> back to where we were now, and we're in an open ear test, right? I don't want to do it that way. I want to have this hanging on the ear. I want this to be at the position of the patient's ear, and then I want to start my test and have it calibrate right here. So it has adjusted this level to be correct. Okay. That's why equalize came up there. Because now I want the position the patient in the position they're going to stay in. You know? But here's what I want to demonstrate to you. If if I was to just use live here, alright? Now it's just measuring my voice. Alright? And I explain to the patient that what what is above that blue line which represents his hearing loss, 
and this is sound from soft to loud, what's, what's below that blue line is not audible to the patient. And so if the English language were all vowel sounds, he wouldn't need a hearing aid. He hears what's above the blue line. Ooh. Sorry for that jumping up. You have a bad jack here. That's why I jumped up. Uh, no, it's not picking it up. Uh. Uh, e. See, those sounds are easily heard by the, by the patient. But what about this? Shh. Not audible. Shh. Not audible. So a word like respect, he hears re, and this is the rest of it. You know. So another good demonstration using live. I'm not using live to program the hearing aid because I don't have any cal any calibrated signal. I'm just talking. But. Maybe the guy's wife complains, hey, George never comes when I call him for dinner from the hallway. Well, somebody go out in the hallway and say, hey, George, time for dinner. And you can actually see in here what's audible and what isn't audible. You know? So using live speech is not good for fitting, but it's very good for demonstrating, demonstrating the need for a hearing aid. A lot of clinicians use that all the time for demonstration purposes. Okay? All right, well now that we've done that, we'll go and do something more real here. So I'm going to try, I'm going to try to put this tube down my own ear. Now if I can't do it, somebody's going to have to come and help. Okay. And you're not afraid of doing that, are you? You've been practicing it. Right? All right, well I did pretty good at getting it in there. And as you practice it, you probably hit a few eardrums on the way. That's okay, because you can't put a hole through the eardrum with it. Okay, I think I'm in. Okay, so now I'm going to switch modes. I'm going to switch to one of these standard things here. Uh, this, this is the carrot story that you've heard before. Right? Now I'm going to hit continue just to let this average, okay? If that was, if that was my final fitting, would I be happy with that? No. Because that's average speech uh, at 65 dB. Uh, but I only have an SII, that speech intelligibility index, of 40%. How terrible. Only 40% of speech is intelligible to this patient. Because much of it is that the actual target, see, the, this bottom line are, these are the valleys of speech, and this top is the peaks of speech. The center line running through there is the mean, or average, of speech. The target is where the mean should be. So for average speech, we don't want the mean to be running below the threshold. The patient doesn't even hear these. These are still inaudible. Uh, and we actually, while this is running live, we should be adjusting the fitting software to move this up to the target area. Um, let me show you another thing that's very useful. If you go down here to, to hide show, uh, you can uh, actually, uh, show that. This is the unaided speech banana. This is where speech is unaided. It's 30 dB wide. See, it's 18 dB from bottom to mean, and from the mean to the top is 12 dB. 
30 dB total. Uh, and so the idea is to take this and move it up here. To take this, which is inaudible, and move it up there. And we moved it up somewhat, but we didn't do good enough. Uh, so I'm not happy with that. I would have to I would have to increase the gain all across the board. I need I need more at 4,000, more at 2,000, more at 1,500, more at 1,000. Even in the lows, uh, it doesn't come near meeting the target. The goal is that the target is on these. Now I'm, it's going to feed back like crazy. This is I really programmed it way more of a hearing loss than it would fit with this hearing aid anyway. But uh, but I just wanted to show you how you do that. Um, and notice that if I if I um, if I ran this again, I could run soft speech. And you see the target now are reduced and, and it's a different color because I'm running at 55 instead of 65. That's soft speech. And I would want to do that. My fitting software, if I engage my fitting software. Uh, let's see if I can do that. I'll get my fitting software running. This is an Oticon hearing aid. Oh, I gotta put the boot on it to I gotta put the boot on it to do it. Uh, well, let's not bother with that. Uh, do you does this make sense to you? Okay, because right now, while this is running live, I would be adjusting. Um, I have on this fitting software, I have a, an adjustment for soft speech, average speech, and loud sounds. And so I would be doing, I'd be adjusting my soft speech in my fitting software right now. Now, of course, without the patient talking like this, so that the mean is as close as possible to those um, crosses. And when I thought I had it close, I would hit continue so that it averages, okay? Uh, and, uh, and then I would decide whether I'm happy with that or not. And it would all depend on, on, uh, on whether, uh, on how close the mean was to the target. And then, after I was done with that, what I could do, uh, I want to show you the different signals that are here. Uh, notice there's two standard speech. The first one is the carrot thing. The, these two are scientifically designed to be the absolute average of North American English. You know, uh, it doesn't have a male emphasis. It doesn't have a female emphasis, um, and, and it's it's the absolute average. And people got tired of that um, of that. Um, carrot thing. They said, I'm dreaming about carrots at night. <laughs> in fact, I'm singing the carrot song while I'm driving in the carpool to work. And my constituents think I'm crazy. Um, and so the company decided that they had better put something else on there. Um, and so this is another standard one. You know? That represents the absolute the average of speech. Right? Um, there are some other uh, significant ones on there. There's a female that actually has a female emphasis. So it is the average of 35-year-old North American women. Okay? There's a child that is the average male and female of 5-year-old children. Okay? Um, why is that important? If you had a gender-related thing, like the guy who says, I understand the boys down there at the, uh, at the fishing lodge just fine, but I can't understand a word that my wife or my daughter say. Well, then you might see how they do with the female. Or, you know, I can understand everybody with this hearing aid on except the grandchildren. Well, then that's good for that. Or if you're fitting a child, a child has to hear the teacher, usually female, uh, all the teachers in the school that my daughter uh, is a fourth grade teacher, and there isn't one male teacher in the school. They're all women. So 
if uh, we were fitting a child that was going to Honey Creek Elementary in Conyers, Georgia, we might specifically use female for see how he's going to hear the teacher, okay? Because they're all girls. Uh, and uh, if they're having problems communicating with other children, that might be appropriate. This live speech is a um, uh, good for demonstration, but not for fitting. Like I demonstrated the need for a hearing aid there. Uh, an ICRA sound, ICRA is International Consortium of Re Rehabilitative Audiologists, okay? And they spent years trying to come up with a mechanical thing that would represent speech, okay? So I'll let you hear what ICRA noise sounds like. Sounds like poltergeist to me. Okay. But what that is, is a, a electronically or machine generated speech. Some people like to use that. The, the advantage of it is this. Um, it, um, it, it is processed by the hearing aid the same way speech is. Right, so, so it's a good test signal, unlike a tone or a noise. Right, it's a, an appropriate test signal. It's a speech signal. Uh, and it has less variance than actual speech. It has less variance than actual speech. So, in, in other words, less jumping up and down. So while you're, while you're actually fitting the hearing aid, while you're manipulating the fitting software on the computer, trying to put the mean of speech on the target, while you're doing that, it's jumping around less than normal speech does, and people find it easier to make fine tuning and whatnot in the fitting. And then at the end, when they're done, they hit program to program the hearing aid, or, or right before they do that, they actually use true speech just to see, you know, verify that, that it works. Um, that's that's a, a very appropriate thing to do. Um, Another, another choice here is pink noise. Some people like that because, again, it's easier to make fine-tuned adjustments. Audiological consultants of Atlanta, they use these and they use that. Uh, for that very reason, it's, it's easier to make fine adjustments because it's, it's less variable, there's less variance in it than there is in speech or even in the ICRA. The only problem with it is, uh, and it is modulated so that it simulates speech. Uh, you, you notice it wasn't just a steady noise, it was modulated because speech is modulated. Uh, and so it is an appropriate signal but it isn't as good as ICRA and of course isn't as good as speech. So I would say that pink noise would be the least good and then ICRA would be next, and actual speech would be ideal. And so if you do a fitting with ICRA or the pink noise, uh, then it would be best to verify it with actual speech. Maybe you're using those other things just to make the adjustment, just while you're making the adjustment, right? And of course, you make the adjustments while they're live. There's one more in there that I didn't show you, and that's this, MPO. Now, that's what we're going to use to make sure that the output of the hearing aid doesn't exceed this. And we're going to be measuring, when we're adjusting for that, um, on the new software, there'll be a target for it, actually. Um, then see that you don't have a target for MPL. The new software will have a target up there. And so, um, these are 85 dB bursts in, in one-third octaves. This is simulating loud environmental noise. Uh, and you'll actually have a target on the new software, which I'm going to put in here. Uh, I'll show you how to do the upgrade. Uh, and then you'll have a target for MPO. Uh, my, my fitting software for the Oticon hearing aid actually has adjustments for MPO and for loud speech, uh, average speech, and soft speech. So I could, I could do all of those if I wanted to. So I have this perfect, uh, but my MPO is, is up there. Then I'm exceeding the UCLs or exceeding the targets, which are just below UCLs, because you want loud to be loud, 
You just don't want it to be so close to the UCL so that the person can't wear the hearing aid in a loud environment. Um, and, and so, um, if they are, then my fitting software lets me adjust those specifically for, for loud levels and not interfere with the lower levels, which I had just made perfect. You know? uh, so it works out. It works out great. Um, you see, um, uh, I want to sh show you something else. Um, let me just go back to standard speech. You see, if I made if I made this measurement and I let it average like this, now of course I don't have the hearing aid on, so this is going to be unaided. I'm showing the difference between unaided and aided now for soft speech. Okay? Uh, and let's say I had several of these on the screen, and this shaded area, which is good because it shows the true speech, you know? Uh, true speech has a, uh, a minimum and a maximum to it. It has peaks and valleys in it, not just the mean. But if I didn't like this and I just wanted to show the mean, I can come down here to my hide show, and I could go to it, and I could... Uh, uh, I could just show the mean only if I wanted to, okay? Uh, and some people do that. They, they end up printing out this without the shaded area because they just want to show uh, that, that they met target, that they made the mean of speech audible and comfortable. Okay. Does all that make sense to you? Uh, any, any questions about the the fitting part of it? No? Okay. Um, all right. Well, so let's, let's do a really a couple of difference then. Um, one thing I, I noticed here, uh, this, the jack for the left is very, very loose. When, when, when you plug this in, it's so loose that sometimes uh, it, it falls out of there on its own. Just by the patient pulling on it, just by you doing this, you actually pull it out of here. So you could be very easily sometimes work, and another minute it's not making contact, it doesn't work. You can feel it when you plug it in that it's, it, it's, it's barely plugging in. It's worn out from somebody taking this in and out, in and out, in and out. Um, and they do this here. They take these out and they put them in plastic bags. I would lead, rather, if it's possible, leave it plugged in rather than wearing out the jack. So you'll have to tell Frank and see if he can replace that jack. Um, the right ear isn't just as bad. Let's see. The right ear isn't as bad. But the left one is a mess. Okay? Um, so, um, so remember the purpose of the real ear to coupler difference. I wouldn't do it at all if I was making a real ear measurement on a patient because it has no value then. It's not necessary. But where it does have value is when you're doing, if you're doing any pediatric fitting where you're going to make the measurement in the coupler, you're going to tell this kid, hey, um, I don't want to use your average RECD. I could for your age and you're nine months old, but and that would, be, that would be fine if you have to do that. But if you wanted to go one step above that, you could actually make the measurement of the real ear to coupler difference and use it instead of the average. And now you're even more accurately simulating his ear in the coupler. Um, and in order to do it, I'm going to have to have one of the pediatric uh, foam uh, earpieces. So somebody go get, get one of those. Um, and you'll notice that on the, in the, um, I'm going to um, hit continue here and then get my test back and go to my on-ear measures. And you notice that they have um, RECD right there where you could, let's say you, you have ordered the hearing aid for this patient and you have made the ear mold. 
and the patient is now used to something in his ear because you put an auto block in there and then you squeeze ear mold goo in his ear. So if you're going to be able to do this, now's the time, all right? Uh, because you will have to uh, have the patient sit still while you uh, while you um, while you put a tube in his ear uh, along with a foam plug. So I, I'm going to select from from this REC. There is a safety on the system that would prevent the sound from getting any louder than a certain amount, like 100 dB or 120 dB, they have that turned off. That means they fit profound hearing loss, severe hearing losses, right? Uh, and when I'm in this mode, I'm doing two things. I'm fitting, I'm measuring the coupler, and then I'm measuring the ear, okay? And I don't even have to measure the coupler every day. The response of this coupler doesn't change. The response of the coupler is the same all the time. Uh, the response of this isn't changing, okay? This is a metal device. But what is changing is the, in order for this to be an effective measurement, you have to use the exact same signal coupled to this to measure the response of that, and then take that exact same si signal and re measure the response of the ear. The only way we know it's the same signal, we're taking it on the same day at the same time through the same transducer. Uh, if, if, we, if we measured this and used that response and then next year used that same response, it might not be accurate because the output of this could have changed. The response characteristics of this thing could change with time, humidity, barometric pressure. It was dropped on the floor twice stuff like that. But you could you can change this, so instead of doing it daily, they have it on daily, but you can make it weekly, because you don't expect this to change so much in a week. We tried to have it monthly and yearly, but it wouldn't do it. Um, okay, so when I say measure coupler, it gives me instructions, and it's saying, take the RBCD transducer, which is this. You should put a new tube on here, by the way. This old tube is worn out. Uh, but Couple the RECD transducer to the coupler microphone. Plug the coupler microphone in, um, and and then hit continue. All right, and now it wants a measurement of the real ear. Okay, so how does it get a measurement of the real ear? Um, you take this. And you put the tube down the ear. Sometimes I can do this, sometimes I can't. I'm feeling pretty lucky with it today. There it goes. Alright, and then use a smaller one than a bigger one. You know, if you've got a big ear, use the yellow one. If you've got a smaller ear, then use this tan one. Roll it down nice and tight and then put it right in there. Along with the two, just like that, okay? And then we're gonna sit, measure real ear. And continue. How come I don't see them? I mean, I hear that, but I don't. You go up to table. Oh, I'm on, I'm on table. Ah, thanks. How stupid. Thank you. All right, perfect. Okay, so I'll start all over again. I didn't realize I was on, I was on table. I'm going, why don't I see it? Um, all right, measure coupler. We did that. Measure ear. This is what you guys should have got this when you were doing. If you got this, you knew it was good. 
Why do I know it's good and valid? This is why. Uh, this is the coupler measurement. This is what I got when I measured that steel coupler. I had this, this transducer putting a signal, a broadband signal, into the coupler, and I got that. In my ear, I got this one. All right? um, and I expected it to be above. Okay? So that was good. These look correct. If you, you should get used to looking at this so you recognize something that looks bad, because I'm going to tell you a story about what happened in Atlanta. And this dotted line that's here is the average RECD for an adult. So I expect mine to be pretty close to that. You know, If it's not, I would be wondering why not. And um, what could be wrong? I didn't have the tube down in my ear far enough. I didn't have a good enough seal with this. If, if the end of this goes down like that, then you didn't have a good enough seal in the ear. You know? And there's nothing worse than using a bogus RECD. There is an, an audiologist in Atlanta, she works for Children's Healthcare of Atlanta at one of the satellite clinics. And she was fitting her first child using this. She, she started working there, she was doing her first fitting. And she says, she knew all the theory, but didn't have any real life experience, no hands on experience with it. So she says, well if I measure the RECD, and this kid is a pretty nice kid, I think I can do it. If I measure that, I'll be more accurate than using the average. I'm ordering the hearing aid, I've made the ear molds, uh, and when the hearing aid comes in, I'll fit it in a simulated real ear measurement mode, and then I'll call the patient in, have the parents bring the patient in, and we'll put the hearing aid on them, and everything will be well. Well, the problem is, when she measured the RECD, she blew it. How could you blow it? Well, you could be making the measurement, and this tube has come disconnected right here. It co has come off the module altogether. Or you're making, you have, you're trying to do it on the left ear, but you have the machine on the right ear. Okay. Uh, or this tube isn't down in the ear far enough at all. It has to be down past the end of this in the ear canal. It has to be in the space between the end of this ear tip and the ear drum. There's a space there. and the end of this tube, which is the actual measurement microphone, the end of this tube has to be in that space. Um, if it's not, and you have to have a, a relatively good seal on it, if not, you won't get this. And it looks a little different on a child, and here's the best way to do it. If you go to help here, and you go down, see here, we measured the coupler, and here we measured it in the ears, exactly what I did. And then here's what we got. And on a child, we are going to expect, right? We're going to expect this, the real ear, to be even more above the coupler measurement than mine was. Because now we have a smaller space, okay? Uh, so we're going to expect this, my ear is smaller than the coupler, that's why there was more output. Okay? The child's ear is even smaller than the coupler, so we expect it to be more above the coupler. If it was below the coupler or something, we did something totally wrong. If it's just barely above the coupler, we're thinking, hey, how big is this kid's ear? Right? Uh, so, know the difference here. Okay? And then when we looked at this, Here's the average, the dotted line is the average um, RECD, really a couple of difference on an adult. While a child, we expect that to be above that, to be about parallel to it, but about 10 dB, 5 dB above it. Okay, 5 to 10 dB above it, like this is. So it's about 10, this is about 5, that's about 10. Uh, but we don't expect something like this. See that tail coming down like that? That shows a bad seal in the ear. Okay, so know what this looks like. So that audiologist got a bogus RECD, and then she went to table, wrote down the numbers, and then when she did the actual fitting in, in the coupler, in the test box, before she called the patient in, she, she entered in the bogus numbers from the RECD and used those for the fitting. Well, obviously this fitting was way, way just ridiculous, you know. 
And she was swearing it was good because she was meeting the target and all, but everything about the measurement was bogus because the RECD was bogus. And she didn't recognize that it was. You will because you that it's got to look like that if it's an adult. And if it's a child, this is going to be even higher, about twice as high. Now, if I was a nine-month-old, that purple line is going to be twice as far from the green. And this is going to be up, up here. It's going to be running parallel, but it's going to be up there. It's just a smaller ear, you know? Uh, and knowing that, you won't make the mistake that she made. Okay. Uh, because she should have just used the average. Using the average would have been much closer than her bogus RECD. So the RECD is, is, is the best thing if you have a patient that will let you do it, as long as you're getting a good one. You get a bogus one, well, you shouldn't even have bothered because you would have been better off using the average RECD. Does that make sense? <clears throat> That's good. All right, so now, what time is it? All right, it's, it's 10 minutes after 4. Um, and I think we will um, probably get out of here around 4.20, 4.30. That'd be okay. Won't keep you exactly till 5 o'clock. All right. Okay. okay. So I just want to show you a couple of other things that are on here that are interesting that are in this, these tests that you can do um, on the ear. The main thing, of course, was speech mapping. Um, and we went through that, so I hope you understand that. Uh, you could do the test for directional microphones on the ear, but it's too hard to do. It's too hard to control for. Okay? If you were to do it, you would have to set up a speaker in back of the patient. And this would be the front speaker, and it would be a speaker in back of the patient. There's a place in back of the verifit to plug that in. Um, but you know, there's a lot that you can't control for. So we would rather do it in here. Uh, position it properly in here, move it around until you get the maximum separation, and then hit continue to save it. And you'll, you'll see the, uh, the effect of the directional microphone. Uh, feedback, I'd rather do it in here. Because if you don't do it in here, you're going to have to just have the patient cup their hearing aid negative feedback. You don't have as good a control. When you do it in the test box, you have perfect control of it. You know? So you're better to test the efficacy of the feedback reduction and how it affects the response of speech in the test box. Same thing with the noise reduction. You're going to play the 85 dB vacuum cleaner out in free field. You're better off in the test box. However, uh, 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 what the RECD is here so when you just want to measure it, so you don't have to go into the test to this, this setup in order to do it. And another good test is occlusion effect. This is a measurement of an occlusion effect. Um, you're fitting somebody with a substantial hearing loss, and they have a substantial ear mold, whether it's a um, an in-the-ear hearing aid or whether it's a behind-the-ear hearing aid. You have a substantial ear mold that may have a vent, it may not have a vent. Um, but the patient is complaining about what we call an occlusion effect. He will say something like this, I don't like the sound of my own voice. I sound like I'm down in a barrel, like I'm in a tunnel, something like that. You can hear occlusion effect yourself. You just start speaking and then you plug up your ears and talk as well, you're hearing the occlusion effect, you know. So, this, but what to do when a person comes in complaining about something that you think, oh, that sounds like an occlusion effect. How do you know what to do? Because there's two things you can do. You could either just turn down the low frequencies, because that's what he's complaining about. You could just turn them down on the fitting software and let them go. Um, but it'll be right back if he really has an occlusion and the occlusion is causing the problem and not the fact that, oh, he just likes less low frequencies. So it'd be nice to know whether there is a, uh, a substantial occlusion effect or not. 
if there was an, a, a substantial occlusion effect, then a better thing than turning down the low frequencies is to reduce the occlusion. How would you do that? Increase the vent size, increase the slit leak. You know what the slit leak is? Everything that fits in the ear, that's custom, that fits in the ear, fits either tight or loose. Well, the more loose, the more slit leak there is. Okay? Some people take hearing aids out, even custom in the ear hearing aids, and put them on a grinder and make them fit a little bit looser. They're increasing the slit leak. Some hearing aids um, that uh, have vent sizes that you, it's called an adjust a vent. You can put different vent sizes in it. Some people have actually even drilled out the vent to make the vent more of a vent, let the more air in it. Okay, so here's how the occlusion effect would work. I choose occlusion effect because I, I have a patient that's cl uh, claiming, uh, claiming to have um, this complaint. And so I want to find out, is there an occlusion, a true occlusion, or should I just turn down the lows and let them go? All right. So I'm going to continue here, and I get this screen. And what I want to do is, is put this on and put the tube in the ear. And I'm going to try to fake an occlusion effect for you. Okay? When I hit start, I get a little thing that says, all right, you're going to have to insert the tube in the patient's ear and the ear mold uh, for the custom hearing instrument or the custom hearing aid, like the in-the-ear hearing aid, uh, and turn the hearing aid off, all right? So the tube is in and the hearing aid is in, but the hearing aid is shut off. Because I don't want to measure the output of the hearing aid, I want to actually just measure the amount of occlusion that the hearing aid is making. So sometimes I can do this and sometimes I can't. I did it really good two times. Alright. Uh, so the hearing aid's off now. So now, notice it says, have the patient make the E sound, vocalize it, go E like that, all right? So I'm hitting continue. E. And it is, did you see that? E. Now I did it, I put my finger in my ear to fake it, all right? I'm faking an occlusion. I had the tube in the ear. Uh, but I would have the tube in the ear and the custom uh, hearing aid, the ear mold, whatever hearing aid is shut off. And if, if you have any more than 12 dB, this turns red, all right? Because here's, the, um, here's the, the microphone in the ear is measuring this. My E in my ear was 101 dB, okay? Um, outside of the ear, it was 82 dB. The difference is 19. Okay, that's the occlusion effect. Right, um, and when that's over 12 dB, it, it's this line is red, meaning that is a significant occlusion effect. So now, if the patient has that complaint and you measure this, well, turning down the low frequencies isn't going to fix it. The only way going to fix it is make less occlusion, which would be increase the vent, get get more air into the ear somehow. Make it less tight of a fit, less airtight. Okay, uh, and uh, now if you measured this and if it, if it's below ten, if it's between twelve and eight, it'll be yellow. If it's below eight, it'll be green. So if it's green, you say, hey, there's no occlusion effect here. I'm just going to turn down low frequencies. That's just his own preference. I'll turn down low frequencies. He'll be fine. Uh, if it's yellow, you probably get away with turning down low frequencies too. But if it's red, then you'll want to really consider doing something to reduce the occlusion. Make sense? Very easy to do. Uh, and there's no other way to know. Some of the things that we've been doing this afternoon on here, there would be no other way to know if you didn't have something like this to, uh, to make the measurement on. Okay. So.
let's see what else we have that we had gone over. Um, I have some people that still measure insertion gain. So we should just take a look at that. We only have a few minutes left. Let's just take a look at that just to see what, what it is. Do um, you remember when you were studying um, about real ear measurement and hearing aid fitting, do you remember hearing terms like the real ear unaided response and the real ear insertion response, real ear insertion gain, R-E-U-R, R-E-I-R. You never heard those? Okay. Well. Are you taking a break? No, we're not taking oh, a break. God. But you, of course you come back, we're almost done. Oh, no, 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 I knew it was going to happen. But okay. really, you didn't take one break? Oh, no. well, we did take oh, a break. Okay. Yeah, we took a break. Okay. We're just oh. not taking a break at the moment. No, 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 no. Yeah, but we took a break. Uh, we actually went through everything, and we're ending up with insertion game. Cool. I was asking them whether they had ever heard of real ear unaided response, uh, real ear insertion response, and things like that, and they had. Uh, well, that's probably because you don't do, um, or maybe in the clinic here, they don't do insertion gain as a fitting technique. We were using the technique of visible speech mapping. So all of our measurements were in output not gain, they were SPL, output of the hearing aid. In other words, we didn't care what was in the ear without the hearing aid in place. All we cared about is, hey, the hearing aid is in place, and we're going to now measure the output of the hearing aid, the, the, the loudness of the hearing aid, uh, and, rel and we're going to look at that relative to the person's hearing loss, and we're going to use speech signals to make sure that soft speech is audible, average speech is comfortable, loud sounds are not uncomfortable. We know all that because of the kind of graph we have. And that has become the standard, and the gold standard of fitting measurements. Prior to that, we used to use, when real ear measurement first came out, we measured something else. We measured something called insertion gain. Um, when I was over at Audiological Consultants of Atlanta, um, uh, and we were talking about the new instruments they'd be buying for their satellite offices, I, I was talking to the owner of this practice, it's the largest dispensing practice in metropolitan Atlanta, and the owner of the practice uh, uh, is Helena Solidar. Uh, she's well known in the Atlanta area, and she hires only AUD audiologists. All the dispensers are AUD audiologists. Uh, and um, they're known for excellence. Uh, but they have, uh, they have been at this um, from the beginning, and they were always innovators. When real ear measurements first came out in the 80s, they had it before anybody else had it. And of course, they were making insertion gain measurements because that's what we did back then. There was, there was no other kind of measure. Um, and so when she was buying these instruments for these satellite offices, she said, Greg, they will have to do visible speech mapping, just like we just did and described, but they will also have to be able to do insertion gain, because we still do it. We do visible speech mapping, but we do insertion gain also, we do both. And this is our standard of practice. Everybody that works here, they have 12 audiologists, uh, several different offices. Uh, and they all use this methodology, same methodology. So you could go somewhere where you would be doing, um, there are Auburn students from time to time working for audiological consultants of Atlanta. Uh, so what are they learning from this insertion game that they're, that they're not learning from visible speech mapping? Well, here is Helena's rationale for it. I mean, so, because I used to do insertion gain too, yeah. you know, and it's kind of cool you, to see the switched. different gains, yeah. And, yeah. you know, yeah. you, different you, intensities. You switched as most people did. Uh, in fact, when I, when I heard that from her, I said, well, let me make sure that before the Axiom, the new product came out, uh, I had, and, and she, she knew about it before anybody else, she saw it at the, at the AAA last year. And she's been calling me every month about it. When am I going to see that? Um, and 
but I had to make sure it was still going to do insertion gain. So I called the company, hey, are you going to have that on the new product? And they go, well, we wanted to take it off, but the academics made us keep it on. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I'm glad they did because yes. Alina wouldn't have bought the thing. What happened? But, but yeah. I mean, just because she likes to see it and she's always done it, but can you think of some information well, that you're Well, here's what she about? says. I asked her that, and she says, you know, sometimes I want to make minute adjustments. I want to see a 1 dB difference, a 2 dB difference, and I can't see that with these modulating signals, okay. you know. Okay. Um, but I can see it right on here, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so even though I would not do a fitting without physical speech mapping, we would never do that today. Uh, but we always do this too. And we keep this in the file. And if we wanted to compare that this patient comes back six months from now or a year from now or anything, and we want to compare the hearing aid with how it is and how it was, we first go to this because we can, it's more reproducible because the signal has no variance in it. You know, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's the rationale. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you know, Helena. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. I'm not going to argue with no, you. No, no, no. Okay. So, so, yes, whatever you want, that's what you're going to get. So, but but it, there is a certain makes a certain sense to me. Um, so let me explain some things. So this is where these terms came from: real ear unaided response, uh, real ear insertion gain. R e u r is real ear unaided response. Why do we care? Because when we do insertion gain, we first have to measure the response of the ear without the hearing aid in place. That's the R-E-U-R, real ear unaided response. That's this, R-E-U-R. Here it is, R-E-U-R. Um, now, we, this system will use the average R-E-U-R if you wanted to, or you can measure the R-E-U-R. Obviously, it's better the, to measure it. It's the res it's, you actually put the signal in the ear and let it sweep um, without any hearing aid in place. Because what you're going to measure next is with the hearing aid in place. And the difference between the two is the real ear insertion gain. See, gain is the difference between the SPL and the ear canal with no hearing aid in place and then with the hearing aid in place. You measure one, you measure the other, the difference is the insertion gain, right? And there are targets. See three targets here? One for 50 dB input, one for, which is soft speech, one for a 65 dB input, and one for an 80 dB input. And notice that we're measuring gain, not output, like we did in, in physical speech mapping. We're actually measuring gain. So the gain goes down as the input goes up. And where do these curves come from? They're generated from the hearing aid, uh, from the audiogram that I had put in. And they're using the NL1. So NL1 not only produces uh, targets for visible speech mapping, but it also uh, produces targets, gain targets, for the measurement of insertion gain, if one wanted to do it. Right? Uh, and the NAL people claim that if you do this, um, that you'll have, and with, with appropriate signals, you'll have, it'll be pretty close when you do visible speech band. Okay? Uh, so, I just thought you should know about that. Um, so if we were going to do this on me right now, with my, I've lost so many of them before. Well, I'm not going to measure the REs, uh, the, well, maybe I can measure it. Uh, let's go to audiometry. Um, and when it comes to that, I'll measure it and hit Does that look familiar? Measure, average. Yeah, well, we, we went through all of that yeah. on, um, on the physical speed map. Sometimes I can put this in my ear scan because you know, and sometimes I can't. Don't sometimes I gotta get you to do it. Oh, they can they can they don't want to know. <laughs> They're afraid of it. They know you're not. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to run the R E U R. Sure. 
And how does she know that? She's done it a lot. <laughs> Alright, so there's the response of my ear without any hearing aid in place. Okay? Now when I put the hearing aid in place, you might have to come and help me. Though I managed to do it. So I had to, because of measuring gain, I had to know what the SPL of the ear canal was without the hearing aid in place. I had to know that first, because this is the difference between the SPL and the ear, in the ear canal with the hearing aid, without the hearing aid and then with the hearing aid. So now, Okay, well that was going on is when I would have been adjusting this to meet this 65 dB target. Remember when we did the same hearing aid with the visible speech mapping? Uh, we weren't happy with the fitting because uh, according to the audiogram there was not enough output. We weren't mission missing, we weren't hitting the target. Well, we're not hitting the target here either. The 65 dB target is this middle line and we're nowhere near it. So we would have to do the same thing. And it, we'd have to turn the overall gain up. Uh, and when we turn the overall gain up, we might find that, hey, we're, we're, we're pretty close almost everywhere except at 4,000. And then we'd go to adjusting just the octave of 4,000 uh, and leave the rest of them alone. So most of the fitting software has overall gain. We can turn everything up, which would in this case uh, and then once we got it close, we might fine-tune some of the individual octaves, right? Um, so this is, this is the output. That now you actually see output curves, and you see a gain curve. This is, this is an output curve. It's, it's, it's simply the it's an SPL curve. The SPL, sound pressure level, in my ear uh, with this particular signal, which is 65 dB, uh, uh, without the hearing aid in place. And now that I know that, I measure it again with the hearing aid in place. And the difference between them is this gain. Um, and that's what I try to meet the target with. And I do this for 50 dB soft, 65 dB average, and 80 dB loud. That's using insertion gain. Right? And you say, well, I'd rather do visible speech mapping. Yes, that is more the norm, but you might be this might be something that you'll need to know sometime. Okay? Alright, so going back to our menu. So you should now know how to do visible speech mapping on the ear. And if we did it in the, in the test box, we'd be doing exactly the same thing. The screen wouldn't look any different, except that we would be in here using this coupler mic and the reference mic that's in here, rather than the reference mic that's on here. Uh, you know about open fits and what the difference is in the way the thing calibrates and uses the, refer the uh, reference mic to control the gain. Uh, I, I don't recommend you do directional feedback noise reduction on the ear. We know how to do them in the box, we showed that. Uh, we know how to do the occlusion test, and we know how to do the real ear to couple of different. Um, I didn't show you manual contr control. Uh, this is seldom done, really. Uh, but suppose you wanted to take a hearing aid and you wanted to you go to a particular level, and you can choose your level, um, and a particular frequency, and you can choose that frequency, and you just wanted to see what the hearing aid would do. Alright, so this now of course I have nothing in here, so this is all bogus, but this would this would be uh, the input level. This is what the the 
the microphone, the probe microphone is reading. This would be the input to the ear. Uh, whether you can do this in the test box or you can do it on the real ear. In this case, it's on the real ear. So here's the input to the ear, and it would be this level if we had it set up. And then, uh, oh no, this is the input to the ear right here, 65 dB. Uh, that is this level because the, mic the reference microphone is forcing it to that. And then this would be what we're measuring in the ear, and this would be the difference, the gain. Of course, there's no hearing aid here, so there's no gain. And then you'd have the distortion. And you can go around changing frequencies and just knowing um, what, the, uh, what the output in the, in the ear is at that frequency, what the distortion is, and what the gain is. Um, the academics wanted that on there. It's a good teaching tool, but in, in, in reality, it would probably be seldom used. So, what you'll use here 90% of the time is speech mapping. Occasionally, maybe insertion games, good to know about. And occasionally, when somebody has uh, an, uh, a, a type of uh, complaint of an inclusion effect, you know how to do that. And this is a good, easy place to go if you're measuring RECD um, and you just want to make that measurement when. Um, before you even get the hearing aid. Following that hearing aid down. Well, yeah, like, you know, if you know that you're a candidate and... and what, you, you may have just made the ear mold even. You well, know. What, and what we, what we talked about doing is, you know, you know they're a candidate, you know from the history they're interested, you've done all your tests, and you say, you know, come on out here, there's just one more test we're going to do. You yeah. really a couple of different. Print it out, the table and the graph, put in their chart, you got it. We showed how to make that measurement, and we showed what a bogus one would look like how to recognize uh, what the, uh, the curve in the coupler would look like. It's hard to mess that up. Uh, uh, but what the relationship should be between the coupler curve and the ear curve, uh, and then between the average uh, adult RECD and the actual measurement that you made. If it's an adult, it should be very close. And if it's a child, it should be above that by about 10 dB. Uh, and all of those things. And just going back for a second um, to test box measures. Um, if you chose speech map here, it would be exactly what you expected it to be, because it would be what you what we had just seen. The screen wouldn't even look any different. It's exactly what we just saw. Uh, so it's test box. Except that we're in the test box mode. And of course, if, if at this time we went here and we said open fit, we would get an error message saying can't do that. Okay? And I told you why that can't be done. That is the only combination that you can't do. Um, notice it forced itself back to BTE here. Uh, and that is usually what you're fitting when you're fitting like this. All right? We went over the significance of everything here and the significance of all the, uh, all the types of signals that are available. Male, female, the two, uh, the two North American speeches. The new software will have another speech on it. It's an international speech. When you, when you listen to it, uh, you will say, what language is that? It's a combination of seven languages. That is so cool. Yeah. Um, and when would you use that? Well, suppose you were fitting somebody from Russia, okay? And they, they are going to be doing a lot of communication with other Russians. The problem with using, that there is a significant difference in language, in the spectral content of the languages of North and South America and the Romance languages of uh, Western Europe are all fine to just use those two standard English um, uh, paragraphs on, but when it comes to Asian mm -hmm. and Eastern Europe, now there's a significant spectral content to that speech. So if someone is going to communicate a, a lot of a Asians or uh, Eastern Europe, that's Russian, um, Czechoslovakia, um, you know, Croatia, places like that, uh, then using this international language would be the appropriate thing to do. And that will be on there. 
because I'm going to leave you with the new software. Are you going to uh, load it in? You want me to load it in? I'm loading it in. Yeah. Uh, so it's on a CD. These things have a CD player in the back. You put the new software. Uh, and um, also you'll notice, besides that international language software, um, you'll also notice that there are three or four others. And they have frequencies on them. They're for frequency transposition hearing aids. So po these are hearing aids that will actually take a uh, speech component at a certain frequency and shift it to another. Okay? I don't know, I've never used those hearing aids, so I don't know anything about them. Most of the other common hearing aids I've, I have used, and they're fitting software, so I know something about them. Uh, what I know the most about is Oticon, because I have an Oticon. Uh, but those I don't know anything about, but there are a lot of dispensers, uh, audiology dispensers, that are starting to use them. Uh, for different types of situations. Neuromonics is the manufacturer, the hearing aid manufacturer that, um, that really has um, uh, developed a whole line of frequency transposition hearing aids. So this is kind of brilliant. This, this is speech where they took the response of speech and gouged it out. Wow. You know, and you can actually see the gouge in it. Uh, and then when you apply this hearing aid, you, 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 you do it first without the hearing aid, and then without the frequency transposition engaged. And then you do another run with it engaged, and you can actually see the shift. Wow. Yeah. And it's most effective to do it in the test box, huh. but, it's, but it's great. And it'll be in the lineup with all the rest of the signal. So that's what's new on the new software. Cool. Okay. Can you go back to the very original where it says test box? Uh, just, to, just go back to the start. Uh, what's viewport? Did you already ask? Well, he said it's going yeah. away on the uh, I, I, okay. I think it is. I'm not, it, it, it's, it's still on the version I'm going to give you. Yeah. Um, but it might go away in the future. It's uh -huh. not on the axiom. Okay. The idea of this was um, there were some users. We, we never use it on audio, for audiology users. Okay. It was, it's a dumbed down version of the thing. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Um, it was meant for non-audiology users. They were trying to move this into the market of the non-audiology hearing aid dispenser. And everything that we talked about today was too complicated for that. Okay? Uh, so they tried to dumb this down and have them use only this. And it only had, it had a, a regular speech backing on it, which they called audibility, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it had the directional microphone test, uh, noise reduction test, and, and the feedback thing. Like, these were the only four things that they were to use. Uh, and, and they could just go to that screen and be done with it. That's right. Okay. okay. Right. Did you uh, talk about the hearing loss simulation? Oh, yes. That is so cool. Uh, is that on this slide? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, I, 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 I've been stuttering around a little bit with this because I am used to the new software. Uh, and this is improved on the new software also. Uh, you have the same version on, on the new software that's in the Axiom. Um, the reason that this is significant is because um, um, this, is a, this is a counseling tool and a sales tool. Like we talked about in the beginning, all of those things that you, that you can use this for. Besides fitting, uh, sales, counseling, are involved as well as fitting and verifying and troubleshooting and all of that. Um, but here's how this would work. Um, so I've got my audiogram in there. Um, and so if I didn't, I would push audiometry. Anyway, I'm going to start test now. And um, the idea is you're able to demonstrate what a sensory neural hearing loss sounds like to the person with the hearing loss. And you're demonstrating this not to that person, he knows what it sounds like, but you are demonstrating it to a normal hearing uh, third party that comes with them, son, daughter, wife, whoever it is, because you want them to be able to experience this hearing loss. Because when they do, they become an advocate for this hearing aid and for wearing the hearing aid, you know? Um, it also helps you sell it. You talk the wife into it, the man is gonna buy it. Uh, so, uh, and, and there are lots of these around. They come on CDs and everything else. Some of them are included with fitting software from manufacturers, but they stink. 
uh, because they're too simplified. A, a sensory neural hearing loss is more complicated than simply saying, oh, you got a 60 dB loss at this frequency, so we'll, we'll turn it down 60 dB. Yeah, it's, it, it ends up that, that, that the mechanics of a sensory neural hearing loss and, uh, and, and everything that goes with it is, is more complex than that. So Bill Cole, the, the founder of this company, uh, was searching the world for uh, an algorithm that was a really good sensory neural hearing loss simulator. And he found a, a researcher, a German researcher, and, and he, he actually acquired this, he bought it from that, that research. And so, I, I just say that to, to show you how, how good this is. So you can, you can choose several things here, but the thing that would make most sense is just this conversation. Um, and uh, you wouldn't use this. How's your day? You, you, okay, so you're not going to be able to do this. You, 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 wanna, to you wouldn't use this on every hearing loss. Because on some hearing losses, it wouldn't make any sense. If, if my hearing loss was up here, then, of course, none of speech is audible to this guy. And, and when you go from normal to simulated, it will go from normal to nothing. You know? uh, but right now, I'm showing what's audible and not. For the normal hearing, for the normal hearing, um, the normal hearing people in the room, this is their threshold. So speech, this green stuff, is, is way above the threshold. They hear it all easily. But here's our patient. And none of these high frequencies are above the threshold. These are all inaudible to him. The only thing that's audible are the vowel sounds. So right now, you're showing what's audible and what isn't audible. Uh, and you let the person, the normal hearing people, listen to this and say, okay, you hear this? All right, here's how your father hears it. Now that's pretty drastic, and you're sitting back there so you can't hear it. Here I hear it fine. Here I hear that all muffled. Um, or like like you like they're mumbling that instead of speaking it, you know. It's the high frequencies are missing. All all I'm hearing now is this. Mm. That's a great counseling tool because they can see it. You can explain it when you've got normal speech up there. You can see the green areas that are below the, the threshold of his hearing. And then they can actually hear it. Right, right. Really so that's better. that's the way I do it. I explain it to them first visually. And then I, then I actually hear it. So what they were hearing, the only thing left was this, because the, this was this was a moment. Uh, and and I, this is a I, I put in a pretty big hearing loss. I put in, should have should have put in that much of a hearing loss. Uh, it's it's most effective for the guy that is telling you I don't need a hearing aid, you know, uh, where he's got very good hearing in the lows and even into the mids. And then he maybe he takes a dive in the highs. That's when it's very effective because now, now uh, when you know they they get a good idea. Family members get a really really good idea of what it is like to hear with the ears of the of the hearing impaired, uh, and 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 they start pushing for the hearing aid. Yes, you do need a hearing aid, Dad. Don't tell me you don't need a hearing aid. I heard what it sounds like to you. All right. Well, um, I think we covered everything, um, and you know, in one four-hour session, that's about all you can get away with. And so, I hope that's made this a little clearer to you. Uh, the best thing to do with anything now that you've had a comprehensive in-service training on this. Um, of course, you didn't have hands-on, but the best thing you can do is get hands-on as soon as you can. You know, if, if you heard something like this, and then you didn't touch this for 
two, three weeks a month. And then came to this, well, they would all be Greek. So it would be the very best thing you can do now that we've had this little um, uh, seminar, workshop, whatever you want to call it this afternoon, is to dive into this and everything that we've shown today, to dive in it and actually do it as soon as you can. Tomorrow would be perfect, you know. Uh, and uh, everybody that acquires one of these needs to get using it down to a science. The first time you put a tube in somebody's ear, you're very, very cautious with it. You're afraid you're going to hit their eardrum with it. If you do, don't worry, you won't puncture it. Um, they'll feel it, though. Um, but the more you do that, the more you get used to it, where it's easy. Like, it was, it was easy for Sandra to put that in my ear. It's hard to do it on your own ear. But when you get to the point where this is not adding any time to the procedure of fitting a hearing aid, because it's something you have down with science. It, it, it takes you really no time at all. But it actually saves you time in the long run because uh, you don't have the patient coming back. Some, some practices are plagued with people coming back, griping about this, griping about that, and tweaking this, tweaking that. How does that sound? Is that any better? And then, yeah, I think so. And to go try it for a few days. Well, I come back. It didn't, really didn't do anything. Uh, that's constant, constant, constant. Because without being able to see what's going on and what you're doing when you make changes, all you're doing is kind of guessing and relying on what the patient says. Uh, you're making adjustments being, without being able to see what you're doing. You're flying blind, actually. And, you know, part of this, this level course, and they're in this amplification level, so they have to learn all of these competencies, is... And, and it's very labor intensive. They have tons of homework, and it's exactly that. It's we want you to do so much of this that you're comfortable doing it on the patient, that it doesn't inconvenience the patient. You're not learning on the patient. You know, you've already done 10 of these so that when you sit down with the patient, you can get it in the ear. It can go smoothly. It can go quickly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it takes, it's like anything, it's getting it down to a science where you don't even have to think about it. it it's second nature to you. And, and for dispensing, this kind of thing is the best tool. Uh, and and to, to, to be competent in using something like this, which is very comprehensive, it has everything on it, uh, is a major asset. Mm -hmm.